Okay, so I'll just, I'll start by just introducing. So, hey everyone, I'm Jack Hansen. I'm the chair of the Transportation, Energy and Utilities Committee. Um, I just wanna, before we start, quickly explain. So we'll have our Transportation, Energies and Utilities Committee meeting, um, but first we're gonna do, our committee is, has stepped in recently to play the role of the Vehicle for Hire board because of uh, vacancies on that board. So our committee has been authorized to play that role. So we're actually going to do that first. We're going to have the vehicle for high, higher licensing board meeting. And then immediately following that meeting, we'll jump in with transportation, energy, and utilities. So if you're here for that, just hang tight for a minute. It'll sound like we're talking about something completely different because we are, but it shouldn't, um, it shouldn't take, take long. So thanks for your patience and thanks for being here. Um, so with that being said, I'm going to call the order the Vehicle for Hire Licensing Board um, at 5.04 p.m. First item on our agenda is the agenda. Um, is there a motion on that? I'll move we amend, adopt the agenda as is. All right. All right. Second it. Second it. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Oh, okay. So we've got our agenda. Second item is the election of the joint committee chair. Um, so we will, it, I, I'm hesitating because it's not really a joint committee anymore. It's, it's kind of just the transportation and energy utilities committee, but that's fine. Either way, we need to elect a chair for this. I, I, I nominate Jack Hansen as the uh, chair to be the chair of this board. And I'm not sure it requires a second, but I don't think it does. All right. Any discussion? Happy to do that. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. So we've got our chair. Um, and next on our agenda is the public forum. So this is a time where anyone, anyone from the public who has anything to say about um, Vehicle for hire or relevant to the vehicle for hire board can speak now. Is there anyone looking to, to speak at this time? I can't see if there's anyone there, but okay, it looks like not. Okay, um, seeing none, I will close the public forum. Um, if you join late, this is we're finishing another meeting before the two meeting, just to let everyone know. Um, so we will now move into the hearings portion. I'll close the public forum. We'll move into the hearings portion of the meeting. Um, this is um, item 4.01, airport Winooski cab. Arif, Arif, hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, and we've got, I don't know who's going to kick this off, but I'll look to Haley or other staff to Um, so, so to the extent you're looking for sort of guidelines on procedure, I would say if the complaining party is here, I would give that opportunity, that person an opportunity to, to speak first, um, since they're the one bringing the issue before the board. Okay, so we, yeah, we have in our materials, we have a complaint form um, filled out. I hope, I'm sorry if I mispronounced the name, please correct me, but Gay Tan Provost is the uh, complainant. Uh, is that person here, either in person or on the line? Okay, not seeing them. And they, they were notified of this meeting, right? Correct, Taylor? Um, if, if Sarah Montgomery is present, is she in the room or on the line? I know that she did send letters. Um, and I believe based on my conversation with her that the complaining party was did represent that he was planning to be here. And the last conversation I had with her, she had not heard from the uh, taxi driver who is the subject of the complaint. Hey, Haley, yes, I'm here. Um, yes, I do. sorry, you're very small in the back of the room. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I did notify him via letter and email, and he did say he wanted to join um, remotely. I don't see him there necessarily, but he did indicate that he would like to join. Okay. 
Oh God. Um, all right. Well, so I'm not seeing. I'm not seeing a present. So, um, I guess then we would go to um, the 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 complainee. I don't know what the proper word is, but um, are you? Were you the one who received the complaint? Or? Yeah. Okay. Would you mind coming forward to to speak on that? That's sure. Um, okay. Yeah, you want to join us right here, and that way we can all see you. And oh, see on my screen. Yeah. So, um, thanks for being here. Um, so we've yeah we've received this written complaint, and I don't know if the complaint will show up to speak, but um, I think we want to give you the opportunity to speak to it and respond and we do for this process we do have people take an oath that they're telling the truth so um Haley would you be able to administer that sure I can do that so if you could just um identify yourself for the the board's record sir and then I'll I'll swear you in and put you under oath if you're going to give testimony to the board okay my name is Adam Harris um, owner of Burlington Airport Taxi. Thank you. And yeah. sir, could you just raise your hand? So your right hand so I can see it on the screen, please. Thank you. Do you swear or affirm the testimony that you'll give before this board this evening relative to the complaint under consideration? Will be truthful to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yeah, I swear. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, great. So the floor is yours. Yeah, please share whatever you'd like to share. Okay, my maybe like my English manner is pretty good. I'm not from here. I'm from Iraq. I'm almost here, like um, 11 years, 12 years. And I started my business like 10 years ago. And I don't have any complaint from the airport or from Burlington area, or Vermont or Montreal. When somebody lied to you the first time, second time you will be trust him. This question is for you. I need to add when somebody asks that to me. If, you're somebody, if you're, I love you, next, uh, next time, you'll be fast me or not? No, I understand. It's, it's not really a back and forth, but no, because I understand the point. This, yeah. yeah. Every customer, when you pick him up, especially when COVID 19, when they start COVID 19, every customer, when you take him to Montreal or to the border, we ask, do you have negative COVID test? Okay. The, his son, they said yes, was like two people. I told him, do you have any negative COVID test? Because I don't like to get COVID. If you have that positive, I will not take it. I take just all, I, a lot of people call me. They said, I have like positive COVID test. Can you take me to the border or to Montreal? I told him as well. Because my sister, she passed away because for the COVID-19. I don't like to, to pass away too. And I told him before I pick him up, do you have COVID test? He said, yeah, uh, COVID test, uh, negative COVID test. He said, yes. That one is his name, I think. I have in my reservation. And when I pick him up, I go, like uh, to charge to, to the border. And when he make a reservation, I told him that uh, he said, I need to drop off before the border. And when I try, I told him it's okay, I will cross the border here because it's like 10 minutes or seven minutes walking. I feel like to the customer, they have a lot of luggage. I told him it's okay, I will cross the border with you. When you get to the custom, they, they talk with the, with the officer by French. I'm not like speak French, just I understand a little bit. I hear they have positive COVID test. And I told the, the officer, I told him that they have like, uh, one of them, they have like COVID, uh, positive COVID test. They said, yes, one of them, because the COVID, the, the COVID test, it came to go through out like inside the Canada at least 72 hours. 
of anyone when you get the COVID test should be like before COVID uh, 72 hours to get inside the Canada. And I don't mind when I ask you from the officer, why I when I ask you, like, do you have a negative COVID test? He said, yes. He said, no, because I had like 10, 15 days uh, positive COVID test. I had like uh, coronavirus before. I told him, you have like positive COVID test. He said, uh, he said, no, like that one, 10, 15 days. I told him, how oh, come to the officer told you that like, you have a like, positive COVID test? Okay, and after that, I pulled my car because they said, okay, you can go like anyone they have a COVID test, you should be like quarantine 14, 15 days in Canada. And I pulled my car away, like uh, in the parking lot near the custom. And I went inside the custom. The officer there said, we can't do anything for you. And after that, I give him the luggage. He said, like, you hold the luggage at the trunk or something. I can't do anything from the, the, the custom. Because over there, like, I can't just stay, like, if you, I stay, like, I, uh, I do, like, something wrong, the old officer will go outside. And I give him the, the luggage. And I called his dad because his dad, they make a reservation. And I told him, please, can you make a reservation online? And he put all the credit card information. And when uh, I called him, I said, I need to charge you extra, under $75 extra, because I will stay home in three days because close contact. He said, first, he said, yes. After five minutes, when I charge him, he said, no, you can't charge me two times because I charge, first I, I charge his son by credit card. And after that, because I need to stay home on three days. If you, he told me like when, before I pick him up, I have positive, I will not take him because I'm not like, and I have my little boy. He has an asthmatic. I can, I can like, and I stay three days without work and only myself in room and on the bring me all the food and something like this. After that, I went to take test and I get negative. And I tried to call him, tell him, it's okay, I will bring money back for you. Just they send, every time they send me a message, like something effort, or they call me. And I said, okay. And uh, yeah. after a uh, like month ago, they get money back from, because they didn't do for, they, they said that they do dispute, dispute for uh, the bank, and I didn't do for that. And I said, okay, so I don't care about 275, but what I do? And this is the, all the issue. And they said here, like, I drive 120 miles per mile, or 120 kilometers, I think, per, uh, 120 kilometers per hour, and for bad weather, who's stupid they drive like 120 for like uh, for uh, bad uh, weather? I have I have a, I have a bird. like I'm not stupid. I drive very fast, and I have family. I have three kids, and uh, this guy I didn't trust him because why he? I told him why you like me? Why you like to me like? When I pick you up, she be told me the truth. Like, like because I have like little ba baby, like has asthma, like 10 years old, like every, in his school, they have like uh, down like uh, for healing and, and they have like one home and every day they take one capsule like from, like because he came to breathe without them. And if you get COVID like from him, because close contact, I don't care if you 10 days, 15 days, you never know. Just the, the guy or his, uh, I don't know, like his girlfriend or sister, I don't know. She has paper and I went to the, to the, the custom two days ago. I told them I need peace, the, the proof for copy of PCR COVID test. And doesn't give me, they said you can't give anyone for uh, 
especially for people. And that's it. I don't have anything to do. And they sent me a lot of message. I didn't answer to him. Okay. Thank you for, for sharing all that. Um, are there questions from committee members? Yeah, I have a question. Um, so the, um, just looking at the timeline here. So the daughter-in-law had tested positive on the third with a PCR test, and she tested negative on the 11th with an antigen test. How come, how come, if she had negative COVID test, why the officer that told her like here, you have a positive COVID test? Why? I just, just I need to do, if she has like negative COVID test, you will not tell her like any positive, and it was like talking by French language. I understand they told him like positive. Okay. And I asked the officer, I told him she has like, the, like I, I, I remember like I told her she has, or I asked, I told him yes, he's a, he had like, they have like uh, one of them positive COVID test uh, down at least 72 hours. Now, like you said, like January 3rd, I pick him up January 17th. Like how many days? Like around 13, 14 days. And there was the COVID, the positive COVID test. That that one when I crossed the border, not like January 3rd. If you they have like January 3rd, COVID test positive. And take another one which day. Peace. They said the um they said this the uh, a negative antigen test on the 11th, which was um you know, six days before. Okay, no, set, go, if you need, I know you, nobody can cross the border if he doesn't have a uh, negative or positive COVID test at least 72 hours. You can call the custom and talk about it. So did they allow them, your passengers across the border? Did they allow them to cross? Yeah, yeah. if you, they have, the, the Canadian custom, if they have like negative or positive, if they have a positive, uh, positive, you will stay home in Montreal 15 days, no more. Just if you have a negative, when you go to Montreal, okay, you will be do another COVID test or you need to do COVID test at the border. They have like a tent, you can uh, get a COVID test from there. If you get another COVID, negative COVID test, you will let you know, it's okay, you can go outside. Just when you have a positive, you will stay 15 days. After 15 days, you will do another test. I understand. I have one other question about the amount that was charged. Um, they prepaid you $175. I, 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 yeah, I and charged him. And so there was that payment. And then there was an additional payment yeah, for yeah, $175. Yeah, I, told him, I, told him, I called him before the charge. I, because I told him I will stay three days. Like, uh, that one close contact. They have like was a cost test. I charge him like one seventy five. I from the old credit card. He said oh, yes. After five minutes, he called me back. He said no, you can't charge. And my my son like uh, there was like they have uh, COVID uh, like uh, positive COVID test. I told him no. Right so, now. Yeah. So so my question is, what was the total amount? Charged it was at three hundred and fifty dollars. Three fifty one seventy five. And then one hundred and seventy five dollars was charged back to you. Yes. From the, there was a charge back against. The you know, sent him back. So the back total the, the total amount paid was the original amount. Just one seventy five. Yeah. Okay, thank you. That's all I have. Right. Yeah. The, only, the only you let me just understand this. You only collected the, the fee that you had originally charged when all is said and done. Yeah, no, the first time, yeah, just the first time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 175, I charged my card. Like it was his son, they have his credit card. I charge 175. And uh, when I hear that one, usually I charge extra. Then be because like each day, maybe like 150. Like I should, yeah, I told him, it's okay, I will charge 175 for three days quarantine. I will stay three days quarantine. I will lose money. I, I have, do you know how much I pay, like pay, uh, like payment every month around six five thousand dollars insurance like like each car 
uh, like six hundred dollars insurance, personal personal car, not like the commercial car. What about insurance? Okay, I pay like every six months like around five four thousand dollars insurance. I pay phone like three hundred dollars. I now I have four phone for uh, for my business. I pay like house rent uh, everything like around five thousand dollars. If I stay three days, who will we give me money? Understood. Understood. And why why he lied to me? I did just uh, I told him please. Why? He said no, we don't. I don't know. The officers they, they have like you said like we have a positive COVID test. <laughs> and I didn't do anything like he said like uh, the whole the the luggage I think by the complaint. No, just I went inside the office uh, inside the custom. To talk with us, somebody else over there, and he said, We can't do anything for you. Any other questions? Okay, so when did you refund the second charge? I have like a uh, day, like I think 15 20 days ago. Okay, from the PayPal, my account, PayPal, and they they do like a dispute and don't do anything. So, so, so that's, I said, It's okay. I have all they went them. through. That yeah, thing. they go through. They told me that told me they send them money back to them. And um, the, the complaint confirmed that they received that. I don't know. I don't talk to them. Just I, I, I received two emails from the bank. bank. They said the money, the money already refunded to the customer. And you have, you have that on your. Yeah. Hey. So. If we can get, we have, do we have that document on our side or, or maybe I should be on you? I, I, I'm suggesting that somehow we capture if he has. Uh, if you, I need the money, that one, I will not bring him back. I have the all the information with the reservation. They make it. They send me all when I have them, uh, when they make all my reservation, should I have some spot like to put the credit card information? Okay, when he put, I have the all information, just I said that it's okay, I don't need like uh, because I didn't get any COVID. Yeah, can, you, I can was, you send us those just those receipts? Okay, so that's it. Who would be the best person to send those to? Haley, send it to the city attorney's office. Is that yeah, right? You can either send them to me or Sarah, since you received the complaint, and I don't know if you received any other information from the complaining party, if you want to keep all the evidence in one, all of the materials in one place. Sure. It's okay. All right. Any other questions from officers? Okay. Great. Um, all right. Well, since we don't have the complainants here, um, I think we should move on to the deliberative session. Um, <coughs> is, that, is that appropriate at this point? I mean, if that's directed to me, I think I think that's appropriate, Chair Hanson. I would just say that, you know, if there's other materials that are incoming that the board wants to consider in its decision, I would make sure those get get sent through before you sort of close the the fact finding or the fact taking portion of the hearing. So it sounds like there's some some additional receipts and things of that nature. I would suspect the board might want to consider that when it deliberates. Yeah. Great. Have you been able to find those? Sir? Excuse me, sir. Were you able to find the receipts? Yeah, I've tried. I'm sorry about that. Because they sent me by email. Is it appropriate to close the, the this portion of the hearing except documents that uh, would be submitted with regard to the uh, uh, <coughs> the um, 
the refused payment um, and any other thing that's in transit and then to hold uh, a, um, um, a deliberative session um, outside, which does not, I mean, it does not have to be done in public under the public records law. So we can do that. And then as long as we issue a written decision, which I think is probably what has happened, I am new to this board, then um, I will send you that. as long as that's in open, if that's uh, open and public, then, um, then we, would, we would be all set. Yeah. So that would be I think that would, yes. I saw that, Sama. Yes, one thing. You want to me? Yes. Oh, yes, I want to do that. Yeah, I mean, so it sounds like we have it now. <coughs> you send it to Sarah, then we'll have it documented as part Absolutely. of the text. All right. Um, so for the, del the deliberation, I think, yeah, Councillor Bergman's right, is that we can do that now in public. We can also. My understanding is we're able to do that over email as well if we prefer, right? Yes, that's correct. You can you can just you know put everybody on notice that you'll be taking the matter under advisement, entering into a deliberative session, and that you'll issue a written decision, you know, at, at some time in the in the coming week. Okay, that would be my that would be my recommendation, just so we can because we've got folks waiting to take up the two meeting, and we still. I'd prefer to be able to review that yep. document as well as, as we deliberate. So, um, does anyone want to make that motion? I would make that motion that we close this portion of the hearing, except to accept evidence that has that will be coming in that's been referenced today. Uh, I reckon if somebody were to send in, if the other side were to send in. And I'd make this as part of the motion. It's a little more complicated than simple motion. That we would reopen the hearing. I mean, if there is more that comes in, we can close. You know, we can close it. But given that we're going to be accepting <coughs> this, uh, I, I am fine with uh, with reopening if we get something that's material uh, to this. But absent that, um, I would uh, move to close this uh, fact finding. Uh, and then uh, we can move into deliberative um, at our convenience, so to speak, and issue a written decision based on the evidence that has been submitted uh, at the hearing and to the committee. Does that work, uh, Haley? Yeah, absolutely. I don't see why not. I think it's been summed up nicely. You know, it doesn't have to be in a, a public session for the board to make its decision. And that can that can happen at the, you know, at the convenience of the board. So once all the materials are submitted, then the board can enter its deliberations and we'll get a written decision out. I might just suggest, you know, you set a deadline or some sort of sort of when the when the fact finding or when the board will stop accepting materials so that it can move into its deliberations. I mean if you have sent that right if you have already sent it and she got it, I would say that we give one week for things that may be in transit or somebody like they forgot that this was happening and they want to submit something. So but absent a very short window that everybody's gotten notice. He is here. Fundamental fairness. And so, do you know, like 10 years, I have a lot of credit card. Don't have any happened though. Uh, maybe like a thousand credit card in my file that year. I don't have a, I didn't do that one. Just I call him first after when I drop his son. And I call him, I told him back because I need to quarantine. I will charge extra 175. He said, okay, after five minutes or three minutes, he called. He said, no, you can't. my son doesn't have that. I, I, I understand. Thank you. Okay. Um, so the motion's been made and seconded, and Councillor Bergman's proposing to give an additional week for materials collection. I think I, I think we can just give till the end of this week. I mean, these hearings, people are supposed to show up and do it then i'm good to that so we're already kind of extending beyond that okay i changed that to the end of this week okay that would be fine that's what would be as well all right any further discussion 
Um, seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Um, okay, so we've completed the hearing. We'll issue a written decision um, in the next couple of weeks. Um, so we'll notify you of that. And thanks for, yeah, thanks for being here and providing testimony. If there's other materials, you can send them by the end of the week. Absolutely. All right, Thank great. You. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Is there a motion to adjourn the vehicle for higher license board transportation and utilities joint committee? Yeah. Second. We've been seconded. Thank you. All those in favor, please say or any anything else from staff. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Were you gonna say something, Haley? Oh yeah, I was just gonna say, Sarah, if you wouldn't mind, I guess just reaching out to the complaining party one last time, letting them know of the end of week deadline to submit anything, that would be great. Okay, I'll do that. <clears throat> All right, great. Thanks everyone, and thanks everyone who's been waiting. Um, we'll now call the order the Transportation, Energy, and Utilities Committee meeting um, at 5.35 p.m. And first, I'd like a motion on the agenda, please. I'd move to adopt the agenda as proposed. I'll second that. All right, moved and seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. So we have our agenda. Um, next item is the minutes from 314. Um, is there a motion to approve the minutes? Yes, I'll move to approve the minutes from 314. I'll second that. Um, all those in favor, any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. Okay. Aye. I'm okay with it, even though you don't have to approve the minutes, but uh, by all means. You're going to vote. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you guys are good with it, then you okay. can. So, okay. uh, next item is the minutes from uh, March 22nd. Will we approve the minutes from March 22nd? Second. <laughs> second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Yep. All right, now we go to public forum. So I see we have a number of folks here. Um, we This is a public forum. Anyone can speak to any item that relates to this committee during this time. We typically we let people speak on the agenda item too, which we have two agenda items tonight. The first one is um, the fiscal year 23 fare policy and proposed service reductions conversation related to Mountain Transit uh, and the other deliberative or yeah the other deliberative item is around the Main Street concept um, redesign so if you're here for one of those you'll have a chance to speak when we get to them as well but that being said does anyone from the public want to speak now during public comment if so just you know indicate with a raised hand or otherwise indicate did you want to speak now or do you want to wait for? Her? Yeah. Okay. There's one <clears throat> pen raised, but it just went down. Tom. Okay. Great. Yeah, Tom, if you want to speak now, that's fine. If you want to wait until we get into the, the transit I, item, that's fine too. I, I'm just checking to see if you could hear me, and it sounds like you can. We can hear you, yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, we can only hear him when we unmute him. So if he was speaking previously. Yeah, we only just heard that last sentence that you said, Tom, just so you know. Oh, okay. Oh, I see the mute button now. Did you make comment prior to that? Or? We can't, we don't, we're not hearing you anymore at this point. <laughs> I, I did, and, uh, but um, I, I think I'm good. So I think we should just move forward. Okay, so we yeah we haven't heard any of your comments yet, but you'll you'll have a chance if you're sticking around. You'll have a chance to give them. Okay. Um, and to confirm, you will have to raise your hand so we know to unmute you, unless we want. Okay, to. Tom, were you looking to speak now and give your comment now? I always see your hand up. Um, no. I, okay. I just wanted to make sure I knew how to be heard when, um, if and when I should want to be heard. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. I saw Senator Chinden put a hand up and then back down, but you'll have a chance to speak as well. Senator Chinden, thanks for being here. Um, 
So why don't we, less, is there anyone else right now during public forum wishing to speak? All right, so seeing none, I'll close the public forum and we're gonna jump into the, the transit item. Um, <clears throat> this was referred by a city council resolution um, at our previous meeting, not last night, but the previous meeting. Um, and I will kick it over to, I guess, uh, to GMT Director John Moore or did Director Spencer want to say a few words um, that were joined today by all four Burlington commissioners and alternates on GMT board. Maple and I serve as uh, commissioners for Burlington. We're the only community that has two commissioners. We pay the lion's share of the local assessment, uh, but we're also joined uh, by Tom Darenthal and Marcy. Uh, who's, I'm blanking on your last yeah. name here. Thank yeah. you, Gallagher. And um, we have been engaged uh, very strongly, Meg, at the last meeting, uh, forcefully talked about trying to find other sources of funding. Uh, I serve on the finance committee and have worked with John and others to understand the finances in detail. No easy issue. I think John is here with a PowerPoint that can go through some of the detail. Um, and uh, I'll leave it at that. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, the is yours. Yeah, thanks. So we'll give a brief PowerPoint um, that goes over our uh, fiscal year 2023 budget um, and touch upon some uh, planned service reductions that we had public hearings uh, for a few weeks ago and then talk about uh, the potential for zero fare continuation uh, pending some legislative funding uh, uh, this, this session. Um, so next slide, Matty. Uh, thank you, I'm sorry. Um, so I always start with just a quick uh, ridership data um, slide. Um, this is from the start of FY20. Um, so it does uh, include the uh, pandemic, obviously, and no surprises. Uh, you can see the, the massive drop uh, around February 2020, um, and then some peaks and valleys as you know, case counts have uh, fluctuated. Um, this is important because if we, uh, if and when we go back to charging a fare, uh, obviously, the ridership um, directly correlates with our fair revenue. So um, this is an important slide uh, with or without a fair, but uh, financially uh, more so if we do charge a fair. Uh, next slide. So just a quick uh, breakdown of our FY23 revenue sources. Um, and so we primarily have four revenue sources. Uh, FY23 is still a little skewed because of the COVID relief funding that we received from the federal government. Um, so typically that federal amount is about 45%, but because of some of the COVID relief funds uh, offsetting uh, our state revenue primarily, that's uh, higher at 60. Uh, the state revenue at about 7%, uh, that's about half of what it typically is. Um, the local uh, share, so that is made up of three primary uh, pieces. Number one, the fixed route assessment. Uh, number two, uh, the ADA um, assessment, which is actually based on uh, usage by member municipality. And then there's a, a smaller um, uh, capital contribution of about 50,000, which is spread uh, amongst our eight member uh, communities. And then lastly, our operating uh, revenue is primarily from fair revenue. Um, so in FY23, uh, when our board passed the uh, budget, we were uh, assuming that we would start, we start fair collection. So we have about 1.6 of that is in passenger fares. Uh, the remaining is um, advertising revenue and some uh, sale of equipment. Um, so those are our four primary revenue sources. Uh, next slide. Um, and just for a, a quick overview in terms of uh, the federal funding that we receive, um, which makes up normally uh, 45 to 50 percent of our operating revenues, uh, there is a, a matching requirement. So for operations, which is the vast majority of our budget, um, we need a dollar of non-federal money to draw down a dollar of federal uh, funding. Um, maintenance capital and new starts um, only has a 20% uh, matching requirement, uh, but that makes up a much smaller part of our budget. And then lastly, this is kind of a theme to this short PowerPoint, uh, through the, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, there is a 35% increase in federal funding. Uh, which is great, but again, we need a non-federal match to be able to leverage that, uh, which is really the, the pinch point for GMT uh, at the current time. We have plenty of federal funds. We don't have a non-federal match to draw all that down. Uh, next slide. So this is just a quick snapshot of our um, budget as originally passed. Um, I'll say that this was initially approved by the Board of Commissioners back in December. Uh, staff started working on the budget last fall. 
obviously a lot has changed in the world uh, that's impacted uh, all of our budgets since then. Um, but we did uh, increase the fixed rate assessments by 4%. Um, and so that's about 90,000 uh, total uh, through our eight member municipalities. Uh, we were originally planning about a 5% reduction in our service provided in Chittenden counties, uh, primarily uh, through a frequency reduction during rush hour on the Shelburne and North Ave routes, uh, as well as eliminating uh, four, four daily uh, trips on our Montpelier link service. Uh, the board, uh, as of last week, has uh, reversed uh, some of those service cuts, and I'll talk about that in the next slide. Um, and for the fare collection, uh, as of today, we are still assuming uh, that we will restart passenger fares on July 1st. Um, we are budgeting about 1.58 million in total fares. That's local routes, commuter routes, and uh, the fares we collect in the ADA program. Um, and just from a snapshot, you know, we collected about 2.3 million in passenger fares before the pandemic. So that $700,000 uh, reduction in revenue we have not seen any operating uh, expense reduction, so that's really uh, created some budgetary challenges. Um, part of the reason we haven't seen those operating uh, expense reductions is that we're trying to promote people getting back on the bus uh, and service reductions would certainly be counterproductive uh, in the long run. Um, we've also seen um, a large increase in the ADA program. Uh, that's the complimentary service that uh, for folks that live within three quarters of a mile of a fixed bus route, but they can't take the bus for um, any sort of uh, disability. Um, they have door to door transit. Uh, it's a much higher uh, cost. We contract that with special services transportation agency, probably seen their white vehicles. But as the population demographic ages, the demand for that program just keeps going up and up. In addition, they're feeling the pinch on fuel prices and inflation. So. Uh, that's one area we are doing some studies currently to look at ways to curb some of that cost growth. But if the demand continues to increase, which we think it will, that will just be more pressure on our overall budget. And lastly, uh, for our urban budget, um, we just recently signed uh, two uh, CTA extensions, uh, which is great. We're thrilled by that. Meg was a part of our urban operator uh, negotiations. Um, they're fair contracts. Um, but as you know, the labor market is uh, uber competitive right now, especially for CDL drivers and uh, skilled mechanics. Um, and that has put additional pressure on, on our budget. Uh, next slide. So um, as I mentioned, uh, that budget was passed uh, last December um, and we'll need multiple adjustments uh, to our uh, budget adjustment. Um, so the first one is uh, our board did vote to uh, avoid the vast majority of uh, the planned service reductions after our public hearing policy. Um, so instead of cutting about 6,200 hours of service, we're looking at more of a, a 800 hour um, service reduction. And so that would come in the form of uh, only eliminating two monthly or link trips. Uh, that, that route, just as kind of an FY, FYI, is about 30% of pre-pandemic ridership with teleworking or commuter routes have been much slower to rebound in terms of ridership. Um, we're also looking at some schedule changes to mitigate the impacts of uh, those uh, trip reductions. Um, so that's great in terms of our passenger um, service, but it does add about $275,000 back into our budget from originally passed. Uh, fuel is a massive uh, crippling uh, impact right now, as I'm sure DPW is experiencing. Uh, we were budgeted at $2.75 a gallon. Um, if we end up paying $4.25 a gallon, we're looking at about a $450,000 increase. Uh, fuel, diesel fuel right now is incredibly uh, unpredictable. Uh, we paid $4.40 yesterday for our weekly delivery. So uh, we do not have an optimistic outlook uh, for, for fuel. Um, and then for state operating, um, I do just wanna point this out that uh, we are expecting uh, to get 1.1 million in state operating for our urban budget. Uh, we're in the process of going through this uh, annual state grant application. Uh, that's actually due to the state on Friday. We'll know the award um, sometime around July 1st, but uh, we work very closely with VTrans and we're relatively confident of that 1.1 million number from uh, the Agency of Transportation. Uh, that is about half of what we typically receive. Um, it's not much of an issue in FY23 because we have uh, remaining COVID relief funds to kind of offset that, but that will be the, the balance of our COVID relief funds. So for future years, you know, we need to get back to that 2.2 uh, million number for VTrans or we're going to have some other issues. 
Um, so all that said and done adds about a $1 million uh, deficit from the original budget. Um, we will have, uh, again, based on what fuel prices do for the remainder of the fiscal year, um, approximately $1 million uh, in COVID relief funds that we had budgeted for use in FY22, but that we're not gonna spend. So roughly speaking, we'll be able to balance uh, those increased costs using those unspent COVID relief funds. And then kind of the other um, unknown right now is the amount of legislative funding that we'll receive through the uh, transportation bill. Um, so the House uh, passed a transportation bill that included 1.43 million for GMT to uh, continue the zero fare service on local routes in FY23. Uh, the Senate passed a version of the transportation bill that would include 1.2 million, very similar intent. Um, you know, they had some language about avoiding service reductions, which we've already done. Um, so that will really be the um, kind of uh, determining factor for our, our zero fare program uh, when we present that to our board uh, on May 17th. And so these are just some scenarios. Um, so we're looking at FY23 and beyond. Um, especially as I mentioned, uh, our COVID relief funds will be gone um, at the end of FY23. Um, so these uh, scenarios uh, all assume that um, we will not reduce service as planned except for those two monthly or link trips. And then uh, the only real difference uh, is if we get the T-bill money or not. Um, so that first scenario is kind of the worst case at this point. Um, so if we don't get the T-bill funding, which seems unlikely, um, we would go back to collecting fares in FY23, and we would start fiscal year 24 with about a $1.6 million deficit in uh, non-federal funding. The second scenario is uh, we get the $1.2 million in the T-bill, and we uh, continue zero fare. Uh, this assumes on all routes for the entire fiscal year. Um, we still will start FY24 at a, at a $700,000 deficit. And then the last two uh, scenarios, uh, show if we were to continue zero fare for only six months of fiscal year 23, we'd basically break even. If we were to get the T-bill money and collect fares, we would uh, start FY24 with a, about a $1 million um, local uh, fund balance, which uh, seems great, but we're projecting about a $1.6 million deficit in FY25. Um, now that's assuming fuel stays at four dollars and twenty-five cents, and ridership stays at current levels. So a lot of assumptions baked in there. Um, but you know, kind of the key takeaway is um, we're going to need more non-federal match. Uh, that last scenario, I don't think is politically feasible. I don't think anybody would be happy if the legislature gives us one point two million dollars and we squirrel away for FY twenty-four. So that's more for illustrative purposes. I think the staff, or I know the staff recommendation to the board will be to continue zero fare. Uh, in some shape uh, or form if we get that T-bill funding. Um, next slide. Sure. So this is just a, kind of a summarize uh, to wrap it up. Um, planning minimal service reductions in FY23, only those two Montclair link trips. Uh, at the May board meeting, the GMT board will uh, make a FY23 fair collection policy decision. Uh, that will be fund or pending the T-bill funding and the language in intent uh, in that uh, transportation bill. Uh, there'll be some conversations, I'm sure, if we should uh, provide uh, zero fare on all routes, just local routes, uh, or there's been some initial conversations about a means-tested program, uh, which could extend that funding and provide that benefit to those folks that really need it the most. Um, and then lastly, consider the short-term benefits and then the long-term opportunity costs, which essentially would be um, you know, potential future service reductions. And I just want to, again, harp on this as much as possible uh, that, you know, GMT will need additional non-federal funding uh, in future years, uh, 24 and beyond, to uh, maintain our current service levels. Uh, that's going to be especially true if fuel prices remain high, if ridership doesn't rebound, and ADV costs uh, continue to increase, which all seem uh, likely. Um, and then lastly, um, just want to highlight that the uh, Chittenden County Regional Planning Commission did draft a uh, statewide uh, funding uh, study for transit, uh, and uh, GMT will focus on that this summer with our legislative outreach. Uh, it's clear that not only for GMT, but statewide, that the local property tax cannot support the existing transit levels, let alone any future expansion or uh, continued talk after FY23 on uh, zero fare. So um, providing that statewide non-federal match 
uh, is more sustainable and will ensure that we can maximize the federal dollars, which is actually state law. So uh, you know, we will work with uh, the House and Senate Transportation Committees on uh, introducing that uh, in more detail. We've started to do that this session, but that will be our legislative focus uh, going forward. Um, so that's kind of where we're at, uh, minimal service reductions and uh, very likely some level of zero fare continuation based on the TFO funding that, that we hope to hear by uh, the, March, the May 17th board meeting. Great. Thank you, John. Um, I want to see if anyone who showed up is wanting to speak at this time. I know we have the alternate board members, and, or at least Marcy's here. Um, Tom was here. I promoted Tom to a panelist. Okay. So, and then Senator Chittenden as well, um, multiple times. But is anyone, anyone in attendance looking to speak at this time? Or we have Meg here. In the room. I mean, I'll just say, you know, one of the things that I heard from both um, the city councilors that came to the public meetings and the public that came to the public meetings was more of a desire to um, to find ways to look collaboratively at these challenges. And I know it's super hard for us at GMT because we touch so many different communities and the communities are very different if they're rural, if they're urban and, and the opportunities um, that different municipalities have to contribute are different. But I do think that it's worth finding ways if there are some for us to think collaboratively about what we can do, um, you know, obviously to in increase ridership and, you know, is there a way that that looks beneficial to the city, which could result in some kind of a, a different contribution metric, which would help us draw down our federal funds. So, you know, what, what I would like to hear us brainstorm a little bit is what are the opportunities around keeping zero fare? Um, and are there ways to be collaborative as the largest municipality in trying to really stake out that as a goal, um, I know it's important to the city of Burlington. I know it's important to the GMT board, but first and foremost, we have to maintain service. So that's where the pinch comes in. It's like, how could we increase ridership um, and maybe find a way for that to offset? That, that's what I, I would like at some level for us to explore. Probably not, not tonight, but that's why I'm appreciative of this initial conversation. Great. Thanks, Meg. Others looking to share their thoughts at this time? Yeah, um, this is oh. Tom. Is this yeah, go ahead, Tom. Yeah, I, I just want to compliment, I think, what Meg said uh, by adding that it's important that we be, that GMT be consistent, that we offer a service that um, is dependable over time, that if we're tuning it too much where we're going to you know add a uh, make a, a route more uh, service more frequently and then reduce it and then increase it as our our revenues go up and down that that is not going to project a uh, a service that people are going to depend on and and ride day in day out thanks tom anyone else looking to speak at this time before we go to the committee So seeing none, I think at this point, we'll go to the committee discussion, um, counselors. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted just to make sure that I'm clear. The, the 30 minute peak hour frequencies on route six and seven, those are being rolled back so that they're more frequent now, they're 20 minutes, right? So starting on June 13th, those will be rolled back to every 20 minutes during uh, rush hours. Thank you. Um, why is there $1.1 million less in state? Um, I forget what slide it was, Mike says, my, my note to myself is operating, I guess it's the operating funds that you get from the state. Why is it $1.1 million less than in FY19? Well, and the easy answer is that we have the COVID relief funds to replace those. There's a whole uh, budgeting uh, puzzle at the state level, and I think um, the public transit 
administration. They lost some of their state operating because they also got COVID relief funds. So I think it's all directly related to COVID. We are relatively confident we'll get back to the 2.2 million uh, level, if not higher, uh, in FY24 once our COVID relief funds are gone. But I think there was an opportunity to save some state operating because we had uh, the additional revenue. Okay, that makes sense. Um, and then around the price of fuel, I know that we're seeing a, a spike right now because of geopolitical events and inflation and everything else. But over the last five years or so, I mean, I, I know you don't have this data available, but what is, can you project what's the average? It's 425, it's extremely high, right? Um, 440. I mean, yeah, I mean, we were paying roughly that back in you know, 2010, 11. And then you know, we were paying a couple weeks under a dollar gallon you know, last summer. So it's been very um, volatile. Um, I, don't have the information for I'd say maybe two dollars and fifty cents as a five year average. If it's likely not to stay at four and a quarter, uh, uh, the our fuel suppliers um, think that it will stay above four dollars for the foreseeable future. Okay. Thank you. Um, and the other, the other question I had was around um, the zero fare. I think it's a great program, but um, there are people who ride that could afford to pay some amount of fare. I guess it's, I guess more of a question. I mean, is the, do you feel like a majority of the ridership are from people who can't are, or would benefit from the zero fare? Majority, yes. We have survey data. Um, I don't have the number in front of me, but um, income levels um, are certainly uh, lower, uh, on a lower scale, I would say, for the majority of our passengers. Um, you know, I think our board will have to consider if we want to restart charging our fare on the link routes. Um, you know, those are longer distance, kind of a higher premium service, but they're also our, our lowest ridership during the pandemic. So that may, um, you know, may not help get people back on the bus. Um, but the means tested program, I think, you know, long term would be the best solution. So we could be as efficient with any funding we have and then provide the benefit to the folks that need it. And I would agree with that because I think like the thing that makes the bus an attractive option is the convenience, right? And so having more frequent um, times and ability to transfer and get places without having long waits between different bus legs, I think is real valuable to people. You know, and people would maybe that that wouldn't necessarily have to ride from a financial standpoint, but just as a convenience standpoint to get places might might you might get more more um, more ridership that way. Yeah, we would agree with that. If there was ever a sustainable uh, revenue source provided to GMT, I think we'd have to have some serious conversations internally at the board level. What's the best use of that to continue fare free or to expand our service and maybe have this means test a program because a free bus that doesn't travel when or where you want to go is not very valuable. So we've always had a staff kind of philosophy to uh, prioritize uh, the service. Um, we can do both great, but uh, I think we Short sighted if we were to uh, have to reduce service in the long run because we can be fair for it. But um, finding that sustainable revenue will hopefully allow us to do both. Thank you. Thank you, yes. Councilor Bergman. Um, first, thanks, John. And uh, if you can send us, if you haven't, I don't, I don't think I've gotten the PowerPoint. I did not take copious notes because it's already done. It's posted online. Was um, it? It's posted on the site as of this afternoon when John just emailed it to me. Okay. The did not go back on the on the site. I will love just before the meeting, so you didn't you didn't miss it. I, I was en route on my bicycle. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, in in that vein, I'm really interested in us getting as much information about the revenue. Um, study uh, the sustainable revenue study as possible. Yeah, yeah we, we can get that so, link. There's a, a in-depth uh, report drafted by uh, CCRC, GMT was a partner in that. And so uh, there's $16 million pre-pandemic generated in the state of Vermont, uh, paid for to buy local communities, uh, agency of transportation or fares. So that study led to replace those $16 million and um, an additional 5 million that would help uh, with cost containment and service expansion by drawing that on federal funds. So there's eight options listed, uh, all targeted to raise 21 million. And then uh, the thought would be that the uh, reliance on the property tax would be removed for transit funding. So um, we can certainly provide that study. Would, 
would be very, very, very interested. We have that need uh, across lots of boards. Um, and in regard to, to revenues um, and the relationship with Fair Free, um, and I, I think that we do not want to pit Fair Free against service um, enhancements. If I, I, I don't, I don't want to do that. Um, I am. Um, I, I think it is. It is good to be focusing on uh, on low income folks and what have you. However, let me just throw out that I am a fan of universal programs versus means tested pro programs. I think universal programs have the greatest success. Social Security in this country and Medicare are the greatest examples of that means testing leads to lots of social incohesion and we should look to see if we can avoid that in transportation which is a, a vital public need um, and so when i think about that one of the first places that i think about is the link to employers and uh, to new developments and the whole transportation demand management link. So I would ask you to be thinking in those terms as well as how your services can get funds from those people who have historically said those are not my problem. So yeah, it's, I, we've started to strategize on that. We're working with our institutional partners now. We will continue to bear for you to get some additional funding from them to offset their past uh, contributions. So that would certainly help uh, draw down the federal funds. Um, so point well taken. I think you know both um, you know a forty foot bus running all over town. You know it's probably a dying service model, and uh, the property tax is probably a, a dying revenue source. So we need to start being creative and, and thinking uh, of how we provide mobility in a, in a cost effective way. Yeah, I, I think a dynamism. In that approach, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. Uh, you know, uh, I, I, I'm glad that you're starting. Uh, I, I hope that uh, you know that you put the the, the energy in that. In, in terms of you know this the choice, although I don't support the choice, I just want to say that it seems to me that in the urban cores, in particular in Burlington, where we have the density that this is where we want to go. And I, without speaking for uh, Senator Chittenden, we had a nice conversation the other day at Barrio. And I think that he raised the question of for the more commuter routes coming in, that there was the possibility of maybe some fares in that regard. I, 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 I'm not a fan, let me just say, but it is more, I, but I am more of a fan of that than when we're when we're looking in the inner core or from Winooski to Burlington, um, electrification. If ever I heard a um, an argument for the electrification of the bus system, you have provided it today. So with this, um, can you talk about the ways that we can go from four twenty five to what was it sixty cents? For a mile that uh, BED said, my God, in a much more sustainable way, uh, talk to me about uh, the electrification of those buses here. Sure. So we have two in service now, um, and we are uh, in the final stages of a grant application uh, in partnership with the Agency of Transportation uh, for seven more. Um, so that's a federal program, provides 85% of the funding, uh, and then VTrans and GNT through our capital budget will provide the rest. We've uh, had some initial conversations with the the good folks at Burlington Electric Department, uh, they were financial sponsors with the first two buses. I think there's some potential there for the additional buses. Um, and uh, so we'll be notified of that grant award probably sometime in uh, late July, early August. Um, and then we will look forward to, to future electrification as our federal funding is, is available. The buses themselves are about twice as much, so it's about a million dollar investment. So that's still in consideration. But um, at least right now, there's no shortage of federal funds that. So let me, without uh, thinking about GMP as uh, being a um, you know a competitor, we're not a competitor. You know, it's, it's it, you know that they too would play you know in their service areas or outside of Burlington. Your service areas are outside of Burlington. I'd, uh, I'd, 
you probably are talking with the with them about partnerships, but if you're not, I would encourage that as well. Yeah, they provided some uh, funding commitments for our rural service area. Uh, one limitation uh, right now with our two existing buses is uh, on peak charging limitations. We have to charge overnight. So, um, you know, one strategy would be looking at deploying uh, on street chargers outside of Burlington, in Burlington as well, but so we can do that on route charging. So, GMP would certainly be a part of that. Perhaps our state partners like Senator Chipman can help uh, outside of the city of Burlington. Uh, and the last P, the last uh, question slash point, the, I, I'm intrigued about the ADA um, numbers, you know, because that's, that's rising. And I think it would be helpful to understand those numbers. We do have an aging population. It's an area which, um, maybe other communities would be more willing to pony up than just generally. People seem to like little old ladies uh, trying to get, you know, to from the doctor and, 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 the, and the supermarket. So um, I'd be really curious in exploring that, I'll call it a micro demographic that, you know, is a significant uh, cost to you, that three hundred and twenty-five thousand is uh, that was the increase. That was, yeah, exactly. A one point six million dollar program. Yeah, so it's a big, it's a big <laughs> program. It's a program that cannot get any um, uh, any less big, not shrink. In other words, because uh, you know, as we get up there, we're not driving it so much, or we shouldn't be driving enough. I should get my ninety-five-year-old father-in-law to stop driving. But that's another story. So uh, that's an area which I think we would benefit from hearing about and, and maybe trying to um, understand um, how that can play both with service and with revenues and with a sustainable um, way. Um, yeah, and we are looking at some um, consolidation options with SSDA to try to reduce the administrative and cost of that program. So uh, there could be some short term relief, uh, which may not be significant to the whole program, but we start that uh, path towards a more sustainable uh, operating structure. Efficiency is really important. Yeah, unfortunately, that paratransit efficiency is very difficult to achieve because it's it's hard group trips. Everyone's going to places at different yeah. times. But um, one area of opportunity is microtransit, which we operate in Montpelier. If we can get more ADA folks on the general public door to door service, that could reduce costs. So, we are looking uh, at that in some of our Burlington, uh, greater Burlington areas. That would be that would be great. I'd really love to see that. Thank you. Thank you a lot. Sure. And the board is also just looking at how to fund ADA uh, and spread that cost um, because it is wildly changing year to year in the assessments. And you'll see this year, Burlington's assessment was generally flat due to uh, the College Street Shuttle, ADA, but other communities had growth of, of double digits. So 60% in that case. So it's yeah. pretty massive. Yeah. The ADA costs are paid by towns. Yeah, so guess, uh, um, half paid by the federal government, half matched by local municipalities. Okay. Any other questions or comments? No, that's more than enough. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah, and just to, I mean, just to reiterate, hopefully people know this, but anyone watching is the direction from city council, it was unanimous, was we're trying to have this conversation about how do we maintain prayer free service and how do we maintain service levels and expand service going forward. So it's not just a one time conversation, it's going to be an ongoing conversation and appreciate everyone being here for that. And I think we really need to have a lot of conversations about how we do that. Um, and right now we have this immediate issue of trying to do that in the immediate term for this coming fiscal year. Um, so I guess my first question is, so when we, I wonder if we can pull up the slide of the different scenarios for FY23 based on funding. Can we get that back up? Um, You'll have to. I think it's yeah, it's like probably at the very end. Seven, seven maybe. Uh, my mouse is not behaving. 
Yeah, this is a. Um, I should make that an idea for some <laughs> So my question is, why are we not looking at the full funding and what that would mean? That the house funding was one point four three million. Why is that not a possible scenario? Well, I think if we got the one point four three. Um, these numbers would just be decreased by about 200,000. Um, I did send a letter on behalf of GMT uh, to the chair of the House Transportation Committee yesterday at a request, um, kind of providing GMT's opinion of the Senate version and the House version, and really um, understanding the intent of the two bills. The only difference is the amount. Um, and so we hope we'll get the 1.43. I think it's probably more realistic at this point that we'll get the 1.2. Okay, but you're advocating for the 1.43. You always advocate for more than less. But in, in that, you said 200,000, but wouldn't it be doubled by the federal? The, yes, that 200,000 would allow us to draw down another 200,000 in federal funds. So it'd be another 460,000. But these numbers on the bottom are just the uh, local uh, funding deficits. So this doesn't take into consideration uh, that because we need this amount to match that same amount of federal funds. So yes, we could turn 200,000 into 400,000, but these numbers are only changed by the 200,000. Okay, okay. And Senator Chittenden, can you give us insight into why the Senate chose the lower, went, went with a reduced amount? Uh, happy to. So for the record, Thomas Chittenden, State Senator Chittenden County, um, so I will say this, uh, when the bill came over to us, there were some voices on the committee that wanted to slash the entire amount um, to go back to pre-COVID uh, charging fares, uh, and the arguments were made, and I think they tuned into those conversations. I hope that this uh, council uh, subcommittee knows that I listened, and I reached out to GMT, I talked to multiple board members, also to John Moore, um, who does a fabulous job serving in Green, Green Mountain Transit, you're doing great, John, so I'm really glad you're still at the helm there. Uh, and in those conversations, it uh, became clear that a compromise, a path forward that would take into account some testimony that we received uh, from Green Mountain Transit and when I spoke to other board members, that 1.2 million with flexibility, allowing to um, what I just heard one of your members just comment to, allowing the board to be uh, flexible in some of their approaches. Um, I used to serve on the Green Mountain Transit Board, and I just don't see uh, a, a, a absolute equivalence between the commuter routes that people get on the bus in Burlington and get off in Montpelier to the um, routes, the high density urban core routes. Uh, those commuter routes are of, of better value with fewer stops and longer distances, saving a lot of money on gas and wear and tear on car. And so uh, I saw merit in making sure that the language would, and this was consistent with what I heard from board members. Uh, that saw merit in giving some latitude to the uh, GMT board, who I have great confidence. There are, as I hopefully came through in some of the conversations, it is remarkable the skill and talent and expertise on the GMT board. I think uh, the Burlington City Council is very well experienced as well, but I just always am in awe of the great people that serve on the Green Mountain Transit Board. And so I, I wanted to support their language while still getting the 1.2 million, trusting what I heard from them and being able to dynamically adjust to evolving conditions. I also uh, see value in getting to fare free and keeping fare free, finding ways to do it. I think to keep it after this year, we're gonna need to look at how to get our local communities to also contribute more. I serve on the South Burlington City Council and that's a conversation I'm bringing to the city council so that we can plan thinking out a year or, no, or so from now, how we might accommodate increased local assessments to possibly match or encourage the state to continue this level of assessment. I don't know if that answers your question, Jack, but I, I hope you know that I was listening to lots of different points of view and I found that 1.2 million with the flexibility was a path forward that kept a, a good amount of the money in the T-bill uh, and it seemed to make sense from everything I heard at the time. But as you understand the process and John just tested or sent a letter to the House Transportation, there is one more step, an important step to this process where we reconcile the two bills. Thank you, Senator Chetan. Um Yeah, I just, uh, I think we, we should be looking to grow and expand transit. And right now, although we've reduced it, we're still talking about cutting transit. Um, so to me, it's, it's, it's a mistake to further shrink that money. And the, the money saved from eliminating the, the routes that are being eliminated, how much are those savings? Can you about uh, 50,000. 
for the two monthly early trips. Okay. So yeah, I mean that that to me is the perfect example of we're cutting service to save 50 grand. Meanwhile, the state is the state senate is talking about removing, you know, 230,000, which is so it's just I, I feel like this is it's not only we should be preserving, we should be expanding. So it seems to me um, a missed opportunity. But I I would agree with what others have said is that we should be, in addition to pushing the state harder, I think the state needs to step up more. We should be pushing on other partners as well, including the city of Burlington, um, who has saved money due to the fair free state funding because we've had, you know, we no longer are paying for the College Street shuttle to be fair free. So unless I'm, I'm getting that wrong. There were still some payments for the uh, operation of the College Street shuttle. So the assessment was still there. It was reduced because the fair collection wasn't there for two years. Okay. So maybe the saving was less than I think it is. Yeah, it wasn't the full amount of the College Street shuttle assessment because that included the 20% operating costs. Okay. But there was, there was, you know, there was meaningful savings there. And we recently, city council recently approved a resolution that was um, advocating for $50,000 to make the city loop fare free. That's likely a cost that we're not gonna incur now if this, you know, if this moves forward with fare free. So the city is seeing savings that I think should be reinvested into our transit system. Um, UVM. UVM has also seen a lot of savings, right? Due to state funded uh, fare. Yeah, about four hundred thousand dollars in the last three years. So that's one of the institutional partners we're working with, uh, trying to restructure our uh, limited access agreement. So uh, if we don't go back to charging a fare in FY twenty three, that they're still paying a discounted rate, but still providing something that we can drop out those federal funds. So. Um, there's still additional conversations to be had. I think on May 9th is the next one, but um, they've saved yes, a good amount of money over the last couple of years. We have not billed them at all for uh, during the fair free period. Yeah. So I think those are, I think, yeah, that's what I'm advocating for. And what I would want to be hearing is just how are we leaning on these various partners and looking to get more money? Because it seems like really it's a money, we're talking about a money problem, a funding problem more than anything, obviously ridership. It's gonna take more than just fare free and increasing service. There's a lot we're gonna to need to do to, to boost ridership, but a lot of this is just coming down to money, it seems like. Non-federal money, we have plenty of federal funds. It's the non-federal money that the right. Yeah, so I think we should just be exploring like, yeah, I kind of, you know, part of what I'm getting at, I kind of wish when we look at these tables and maybe when the board's looking at different possible scenarios that, you know, those would be some of the, well, what does our budget look like if we get UVM to contribute what they were contributing or we get the city of Burlington to contribute what they're, they were contributing um, <laughs> or other partners to be able to see and show that to everyone, you know, not just internally, but show that to us as the broader community. Look, UVM, if you did this, here's what we would be able to do. Burlington, if you, fund us at this level, here's what that means for transit service and really make that case and, and show that to the public of what could be possible if folks stepped up more, whether that's the state, local or, or employers, um, and kind of lay out those scenarios rather than solely these scenarios of like, you know, different types of cuts and, and um, you know, budgets that aren't quite that are um, where we're using money. So I think that's a lot of what I would advocate. And I want to I wanna do everything I can to help find those solutions and make those public arguments and show people because I think people want, people believe in the value of public transit. People want to support it. Um, and if people knew what was at stake, I think a lot of folks and institutions would, would pay more rather than allow, you know, some of these cuts to go forward and fares to be reinstated. Um, trying to see what other questions. So right now, today, are there 
fares being charged anywhere in the no. system. So we're fare free until uh, July 1st. We get the T-bill funding, we'll continue that. Okay. Then in port approval. Okay. And, but with service, some of those have been implemented or are, are currently service has been reduced. Yeah, I think it's a little wonky because we, uh, in anticipation of staffing shortages, which actually we're experiencing now, about two months later than we expected, uh, back in early March, we reduced service because we didn't have enough drivers. Those um, temporary service reductions were also the planned permanent service reductions, but those will come back online in June. So in June, we'll be back to basically um, our normal service, less those two monthly or long trips. Okay. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. I, I think what I wanted to say too with the partners, the whole theme about asking more from partners, I think Gene brought up the, the utilities as well, you know, leaning on them. And um, I think that's another big one. But glad to hear that that's already happening to some extent. Um, yeah, I think um, we've had some initial conversations. The, the tier three funding you know, could be used for fair revenue replacement, for example. That's what they use to help provide us uh, the match of the two electric buses. Um, but we don't need that because the state's filling in the difference between the federal funding and the local match. Um, but it could be some opportunity there, which I think would fit in with the next zero plan for the city. Yeah, that makes sense. And then with the electric buses, when are those going to be? Coming online, do we know? Well, we won't know about the funding until August. Um, it was supply chain. Um, it could be two years from August before we actually take delivery. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. I think, yeah, I'll wrap up in a minute. I think my other thing would just be again to advocate strongly for the importance of fair free. I, I think, yeah, I, I don't think we should pit it against service, I think we should view it how we view other public services that are that are made available and with the climate emergency and the desire to get people onto transit and out of vehicles. Um, I think it makes a lot of sense to have it be a publicly provided service that's paid through taxes rather than paid at the point of service, which also makes service worse um, and slows down service makes it less convenient. So I think there's a lot of reasons to, to do fair free. And I don't, I think we should be looking at it from a perspective of, you know, how, maintaining that as a baseline and then looking for additional money to expand. And I, I think it's what Councillor Bergman said too about just what programs are successful. And if you think about like the library or something, yeah, there's plenty of people who use the library who could pay a dollar fifty or whatever to rent the book out, but we don't. We're not thinking about doing that in order to fund the library improvements. We're finding other ways to fund our public libraries, and I think we should look at transit um, the same way, given the importance of it societally. Um, but I'm glad to hear you say, John, that you're you are looking. You know, your perspective is to do both. You know, maintain fair. Free as well as expansive. For, for 23, beyond that, without some uh, significant changes to our funding structure, we won't be able to do it. But that's the beauty of the CCRPC study that if that gained traction, we could maintain service, look at some incremental expansions in the zero pair. That would provide a non federal match to allow all of that. Right. And I think that's what we, that's what this is all about, really, is we have this window right now where we, we all see what's coming. It's a problem. We all think it's a problem where we're headed next year. Uh, so we need to all work together to figure out how we can fund this and avoid that. Um, Senator Chen. I have to drop off, but I just want to say I, I fully support finding a sustainable revenue source to support public transportation. I personally think a most rational assessment would be through an increased set, uh, car, car registration fee. If you choose to register a single occupancy vehicle for either commercial or personal purposes, I think you should pay a 10 or 20 or $30 additional fee on an annual basis. And you do the math out with 200,000 vehicles, it gets a good chunk of money. So that's something I've been advocating for. I'm trying to till the soil on it. I think it's the rational way, one of many rational ways to fund public transportation. I need to drop off. There's other ideas I have on funding public transportation. I think I bent uh, Councilor Bergman's uh, ear on a couple of those crazy ideas uh, the other day, uh, but I hope you all reach out to me going forward. And I'm sorry if you were disappointed in the Senate bill, know that there's still some process left. And John Moore, please don't hesitate to reach out what I can do to help GMT going forward. 
Thank you Thanks so much for being here, Senator Chinden. Really appreciate it. Thanks for making the time. And I love that idea that you just threw out. So here's Councilor Bridgman. Just, just briefly, sort of focused uh, somewhat on what the senator just said. In a way, are you trying to make him stay on? No, like, I'm not. I'm not trying to make him stay on. I'm trying to use you while you get off. <laughs> Shamelessly. Um, you know, we're at a moment. And we can seize this moment where there are lots of collaboration so, um, and potential collaboration. So I guess what I want to do is encourage GMT, its board and its management with its member communities to, um, to do the sort of, it's the cultural building. It's, it's changing the culture and seeing that there is something very fundamental that we have got to do differently. And you guys are at a, at a critical position. So you, but you can't do it by yourself. You have member communities. You, we've got the regional planning commission. We've got, you know, advocates in the state. And so something that would start to really build a community conversation that will lay the build the support um, to be able to assess what we have and to survey and all this stuff has been done a gazillion times. But you know, in, in this moment, what is working and what needs to work, and um, what are we you know ideas to improve revenue sources and service to promote it. This is a project. Whether you have the capacity to do, I know you guys are stressed, everybody is stressed. So trying to figure out how we can build such a thing. Uh, we need that. I mean, I mean, I say that, I say collectively, without that sort of effort, the status quo will not change. So, and we will be far forced to deal with austerity and to deal with affordability. It is a failure. It is, a, it is just slow suicide. I'm gonna get off the soapbox right now, which I just jumped up on and say that this is another idea where, you know, if we can do that, then all of the collateral benefits that we can get from the study on sustainable revenues can come to pass because we will have done the work so that people's first reaction is, I'm not taking the bus, right? Which is what the numbers show, right? So that's an additional piece. And to the extent to which I can assist in that process, I would be happy to do that. Well, and I'll say this statewide uh, transit funding has been studied, I think, seven or eight times over the last 20 years, and nothing's happened, obviously. But I do think there is some change that's happening now. I think COVID is part of that. but. Um, Tom's a, a true champion in the Senate with uh, Senator Birchlick in the House uh, Transportation, uh, but Senators McCormick and Stevens are could be champions for it as well. I know they're committed. So I do think there's an opportunity to you know, get that ground as well. We can do this. He's safe with Great. Great. Any further comments from anyone? Anyone looking to speak? I see some chats maybe that came out. So we're from um, Senator Chittenden. Just okay. about his contact information and having to drop off. Okay, great. Um, if there's no further thoughts, I think we can kind of wrap up this conversation. I don't, I don't know that there's any. It says action on the agenda, but I don't know that we're thinking of taking any action at this point. Unless any councilors have any motions they want to make. But I think it's pretty obvious that this is going to need to be an ongoing discussion with all of us. And I'm really glad that we we're able to bring um, board members and legislators and, and you here, John, um, to, to kind of begin to, to uh, you know, break down those silos a little more and break down those barriers and have this conversation collectively. Yeah. GMT can do it alone, so maybe you can invite and yeah. start the conversations. Yeah, helpful. Definitely, it's going to take us all, and I think government is has an obvious role to play with the shift that we need to take towards transit with the climate emergency. So, I mean, is there anything that 
they the GMT would need from us that would um, be appropriate to, to have an action today? Is there an ask that you have? You know, I think not that I have. The resolution has been very helpful. I've said that multiple times uh, with legislators. So yeah, I think that was the action that I can think of. It's Dagger Chapin. You think of anything? Sure. Well. You know, uh, you mentioned seven different sites. I remember three over my 20 years on the GMT board, but maybe some of those were uh, multiple efforts. Uh, we have at various times on the board tried to set up separate board committees to focus on regional funding. Our board day to day is not going to have the time or focus. However, there are partners out there. We're not going to do it alone. Now is the time to start for next legislative session. And our problem is going to be in FY24, not FY23. So we have a one year window now. And so if there is interest in the community and politically, then I think the goal then would be for us at the board to discuss and the community members to discuss how do we set up some public private campaign, figure out what our goals are, what is our agenda at the legislative uh, level and figure out those non-traditional partnerships that are going to give us more traction beyond the usual suspect. So if you're willing to give us a run, it ain't going to be easy. We haven't succeeded in 20 years. Dramatically, we have succeeded in growing the system. Commuter routes are new. Regional routes are new. That's good, but we're built on a house of cards. And I think to your point, Jack, we could fall and end up contracting in FY24 and 25 if we don't figure out how to stabilize the base. We would have already if we didn't get the COVID relief part. Yeah, that's really hitting the problem over the last two or three years. So yeah, right. And we are, I mean, again, we are talking about cutting service. I know it's less than what we thought, but it's still at a time when I feel we should be expanding, we are reducing slightly service. So I think even this year it's we didn't, you know, we didn't achieve what I think are collective goals. Uh, Marcy, did you have, did you want to add? Yeah, um, I was just hoping to comment just because Senator Chitton had brought this up in conversations with board members about um, fare free for the Link Express. And I've been pretty vocal about this on, on GMT's board, but I just want to say I personally do feel that there's a strong value to having fare free for the Link Express um, as a link rider myself, I, I agree that there's a lot of value to that route. However, I, I do still feel that it is not as convenient as driving. Um, and if folks are carpooling with even two people, a lot of times with the with the fare, which is $4, um, at least to Montpelier, it was still cheaper to drive if you had another person in the car. Um, but yet that's, you know, a lot of emissions going from Burlington to Montpelier, Burlington to Waterbury, um, Middlebury, that you know, folks could potentially justify not using a car as much, sharing a car, not having a car if they, you know, got used to using that kind of route. But if it's if it's easier and more convenient for them to drive because the bus costs just as much money, um, I don't think that they're going to make that transition. So, at least for folks that I know that commute to Montpelier, it's kind of um, or it had been and pretty tough to get them to use the bus before it was fare free for the Link Expresses. Thanks, Marcy. Did you want to respond, John? Well, I would just say um, we need to do some more research into this, but if we were to say fare free only on the link routes, the way we do our driver scheduling, our bus scheduling, we would need to have all of our fare boxes on back online to do the cash collection. So we may, you know, raise one hundred fifty thousand dollars in revenue, but you know, it costs one hundred thousand dollars to collect it. So you know, that will be a consideration we'll present to the board, where it may not be worth the effort to collect the fare on just those two routes. So. In those scenarios, um, we assume that we would go fair free on all routes because of that. We need to do some more depth uh, kind of analysis on that, but that, that certainly is a consideration in addition to the benefits of continuing to fair on those routes. Uh, okay, yeah, that's that's great to hear. I totally agree with Marcy. I think eight dollars a day for commute people that's a strong disincentive in my mind it, because people don't think about their commute as costing you know. 54 cents a mile or whatever it is. They only think about gas and right. they, they look at $8 and they say, I'm not going to save $8 by taking a bus if I have a car. So I just feel like that disincentive, I think is meaningful. Uh, and 
yeah, if we can keep it fair free, I think that would be meaningful. All right. Thanks. Oh, this is about that. I'm changing the topic now. Thank you. Um, but you asked for action items, and I just want to throw out there that. I've seen the city of Burlington convene some sort of interesting conversations to address challenges that the city's facing and regional areas are facing, particularly around like mental health and um, some of the race, racial justice pieces. And I'm, if it was something that was appropriate or possible for you to do, I wonder if this committee could act in some way as a convener of you know, some of the RPCs, not just in Jinnick County, maybe, but really make this a bigger thing and look at, you have a, 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 a like um, committee in some of the other areas around here or parts of the state to really, you know, do sort of what um, Jean was talking about, but at least provide an opportunity for people to come together and say, what are our opportunities in our different regions and what are our challenges and um, even, you know, three or four hours of something really intense where people could really think about that and, and especially define, like, where are we being duplicative? Where are we not being efficient in what we're doing that we might be able to save something if we were, because I just, I feel like it's going to be hard to address these <coughs> issues if GMT is trying to figure it out and Rutland Regional is trying to figure it out, Marble Valley is trying, like, but Vermonters or beings in general that are traveling through Vermont, they just want to know that the system has some similarities to it. And some places are doing really interesting things and other places are lagging behind. And it seems like, you know, I don't know if it's appropriate for you, but I do think that if you're really serious about kind of looking at this in a bigger way, it would be helpful for us, at least in Chittenden County, if not in the five counties that GMT serves to say, could we carve out some time and really put pull out the invitation so people would come and really start to really dig into this and you know would just say like for me for instance i'm conflicted to be a gmt board member and be looking at these decisions and know that i represent the city of burlington that has like these climate initiatives at the same time like how can we help the multiple goals that we all have find the intersectionality and because climate and transportation are so closely tied along with housing and, and social justice and on all these other things I just wonder if that's it's putting out there as an idea that maybe something that this committee could do at some point in time would be to decide if convening something like that would jump jump start the conversation in a, a way that communities would look at this differently than as as you know, Jean was saying the bus, I don't think so, you know, $8 to get to Montpelier. Nah, I can listen to my music in my car. No, that's, that's great, Meg. Thanks for that. And I think, yeah, the transit summit can be really powerful because it touches so many big issues like climate, like economic justice, racial justice, safety, et cetera. None of us are going to be able to do it alone. That's that's the thing, the lift is, is really heavy. And yeah. I do think if we can find ways to come together, we're gonna have more success. Absolutely. I'd love to hear a, uh, a GMT board request that sort of you guys thought about it, and gave us some ideas and said, here, what do you think about doing this? These are people that you could work with, we'd work with you, that kind of thing, something that just, went down the line and it is is sort of like the follow up okay if we're gonna build something for next year what's the step who are the players mm -hmm. you know when do we do this and we just start to do that knowing full well that everybody has is up to water up to right here <clears throat> which is you know, when 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 the when the climate goes really to hell the water's gonna be a lot higher actually. Yeah, there's a lot of other partners too that we haven't mentioned, like some of the advocacy groups that have worked a lot on this for rights and democracy, and some of those groups. Um, great. Any final comments or thoughts on this? Great. Thank you so much, both of you, for being here. And thanks so much, everyone who showed up, Tom, Marcy. Um, I think we're going to close this item down. Um,
And we're gonna jump into our other item, other deliberative item, which is the Main Street concept. We're gonna to go to um, Laura Wheelock and Olivia Therese. Um, Therese. Therese, sorry. Thank yep. You. Um, so thanks for having us here tonight. Um, you guys don't have to stay if your item is done. Um, we are but here. this is really exciting stuff. <laughs> this is exciting <laughs> stuff. Um, kind of along the lines of the uh, the past presentation, we are looking to transform Main Street uh, for six blocks from Battery Street up to Union. Tonight we have uh, a small portion of our design team here who are slowly coming to life uh, with cameras. Um, there's one in the attendees list for some reason we can't seem to find a way to promote. Uh, also, we're kind of echoing. I would maybe suggest that Mackenzie try uh, blogging back on. No, he, he doesn't actually have to. He's with one of our other people. Okay. Um, my team is telling me that I'm echoing. Yes. All right. Um, well, I don't have a lot to say. So. <laughs> Basically, we're Maybe here. Maybe if you sit over here, because yeah. I don't. Were we? Were we echoing back here? No, but I, I'm not hearing Laura echo either. So. Oh, interesting. I'm okay. hearing everybody in that room echo. Oh, everybody. Okay. Oh, everybody. I don't, I'm not on. Not even on the audio. I just I'm heard it. Yeah, on Zoom. On Zoom. Yeah, on Zoom. On Zoom. On Zoom. I don't know. In, oh, has it, been, oh my God. <laughs> has it been happening this entire meeting? Or? No, just, no, it just started. Oh, it just started. Mm -hmm. All right, so it's probably. Just, how about now? Or is everybody in the room now? It's still, it's still happening. It's you, Laura. It wouldn't be a big deal if it wasn't happening for the people on the uh, attending remotely as well. well I can't wait, even can talk because it's so that? distracting. Just begin again, yes. Oh, is it still happening? Yes. Can you can you test it with that one muted? Uh, hello, hello. Still happening. All right, so we definitely only have one mic on. It might be because multiple people have are unmuted on your end. Like they're not in the end. same rooms. Yeah, oh yeah. Like, they are very much not in the same rooms. Yeah, but sometimes there's like a lot of people talking. I wonder if it's related to our our background teams conversation. Is that possible? Oh. Yeah, it's possible one of you all is generating yeah, the feedback loop. Oh, wow. Now is it echoing? I didn't hear an echo. All right. Yeah, I think everyone online, has, I just muted uh, Susanna and it stopped echoing, so. All right, Susanna. <laughs> is it me? Okay. okay, so now when I speak though, do I echo? Because I am gonna need Oh, you're thing. fine. Okay, sweet. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. I just So. <laughs> thanks for your patience thanks everyone for waiting through the other items so we're here to uh to give you guys you are the inaugural uh example of our uh, great streets concept that uh is debuting tonight we uh, will be visiting the commission tomorrow and the public on thursday as well as a few other stops but um we have a great team here with us i'm gonna not hold up too much so we can keep uh advancing through our slides this is the Great Streets Main Street project. Um, our team is composed of BHP, agency landscape and planning, and Grayscale. We have team members from both BHP and agency here tonight. Um, but it also involves a lot of city departments. So while you're hearing a presentation from BBW, we're leading a lot of the outreach. We do have themes behind the scenes of parks, CEDO, Marketplace, uh, BCA, we've met with REIB. Um, it's, it's been a, a pretty significant city project. Those are just the visible departments. Um, there's BCA on my list. There's a lot of other supporting departments that are pulling this project forward. So with that, I'm gonna give it over to Evan to bring us through the next few slides. Okay, thanks, Laura. 
I'm Evan Dietrich with the engineering firm VHB, and I'm the overall project manager for the consultant team. What we're going to talk about tonight, I'm going to give an overview of the project, and then Susanna Ross from agency is going to talk about the engagement we've been having with the community at large. Uh, we're going to look into the uh, deep dive of the toolkit that we've been using to make decisions about what the concept plans should be and what they're going to look like. And then Steve Woods from agency is going to walk you through the concepts in quite a bit of detail, but we'll try to be succinct and move it along so we don't take up too much of your time, but uh, we do have a, quite a number of slides to get through. So as many of you know, Great Streets is an ongoing project with the city. Um, a couple of years ago, City Hall Park was reconstructed with much fanfare, as was two blocks of St. Paul Street. And now we're working on the next installment of Great Streets, which is the Main Street Project. And Main Street section that we're talking about, here's a map. So the lake is off to the left there in the west. Um, Main Street is highlighted. And you can see the project extends from Battery Street all the way up to South Union Street. So it's seven cross streets and six full city blocks is what we're looking at for the project. The idea with the project is to uh, advance the Great Streets concepts that were developed back in 2016 and implemented on St. Paul Street and uh, further refine those concepts and bring uh, the project into construction. And we're roughly going to be following this schedule that you see in front of you. Uh, we got started in late October of last year, and since that time, we've been doing things like field survey and geotechnical borings, looking at existing utilities, and working towards developing concepts in addition to interacting with the public and a number of different focus groups to get feedback from Burlingtonians uh, and business owners uh, from the downtown area to help inform what we want to do with the concepts. We did have the first big neighborhood meeting uh, and that was followed up by a, a business owner meeting at the beginning of February. And since that time, we've been meeting with a number of focus groups and developing concepts that you're gonna see tonight. Um, once we get through the concepts, uh, we're hoping to get city council approval in May on the concepts. And then uh, the project will advance into the design stage. So we'll start with refined conceptual plans throughout the rest of this year. In 2023, we'll largely be preparing uh, the final design drawings and then going to construction in late 2023 is the goal right now. And it's a big project, so construction will extend through the end of 23, 24, and likely into 2025. And um, that may even get extended depending what other initiatives the city has going on um, with projects like the ravine sewer. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Susanna, and she's going to talk about the engagement we've been going through. I sure will. Thank you, Evan. Um, we have, as Laura mentioned, been out and about, and when I say we, that's the design team, that's uh, Olivia and Laura, DPW. Um, we've had a lot of engagement, including focus groups with underrepresented groups um, that you see listed here, 30-ish city meetings that we'll list on the next slide. And... Um, you know, in the meantime, uh, doing public meetings, uh, taking online surveys, um, and uh, lots of advertising. Hopefully, you've seen some of it: yard signs, postcards, um, etc. And so, um, we're getting some good feedback. Um, again, these are the sort of city meetings. I won't run through them. There's the the ones highlighted in blue are yet to happen. So this is a, a living document. We'll be doing another one tomorrow and another one the day after that. Next. Um, and so just to let everyone know, you know, we would really welcome the chance for you to dive into the public feedback a little bit more deeply if you want. We've got um, posters like this one summarizing what we heard at the public meeting at um, greatstreetsbtv.com. Next, we have um, 
Similarly, from each of our underrepresented focus groups, we've got the takeaways from those meetings. And again, I'm not going to sort of drill down into each of them here, but what we end up with are some sort of high level topics that really seem to cut across both residents and businesses. Um, that Main Street's a vital cultural and civic resource for new, newcomers and those who, who you know, are, are from Burlington. Um, that it should represent that diverse and rich culture, history and identity of all of those people. Um, on business side, they're looking at investments uh, needed to support future needs and last for years to come. In other words, make sure Main Street is maintained. Um, and then also make sure that it's coordinated with other city priorities. Again, that's a, a, a priority for businesses. Um, and then combined in the middle, we see the overlap where um, we talk about uh, or we're hearing from folks that they want to see Main Street to have places for arts and programming for all ages, that it be accessible and safe for pedestrians, um, and that we have a clear uh, parking and wayfinding strategy to support um, the businesses on Main Street. So next we will look into sort of our toolkit. Um, as Evan mentioned, we are not starting from scratch here. We have a, a section that was for the most part determined back in the 2016, um, uh, you know, sort of Great Streets project. And so um, we're, we're sticking with that. And what you're gonna see here tonight are um, a couple of different ways of looking at this cross section. Um, and it's important to note, this is what you're looking at here is a kind of typical cross section, um, which will vary. There's, there's right of way encumbrances up and down Main Street that we'll have to deal with. Um, sorry, wait, back one more. I, I sort of jumped ahead and talked about encumbrances, but just to be really clear, what we're looking at um, through the middle is streamlining the, the roadway, the two drive lanes, the two parallel parking lanes um, to kind of a, a minimum dimension in order to achieve a much more sort of holistically um, uh, sort of functioning street for pedestrians, for bikers, for stormwater um, and ecology. Um, and so uh, at the same time, you'll notice underground, we're gonna be replacing utilities. So this is not all just about changing things at the surface, but really digging down deep and, and making sure Main Street functions at every single level. And so yes, um, while that's our ideal section, the next image here shows a few places where we know we have encumbrances on the right of way at the Griffin, at City Hall. Um, so while we we're striving to kind of achieve a, an ideal section throughout, we know there are places that won't be able to happen and we'll just, we'll work with that next. Um, and then just to sort of put some numbers to what we just described in section, um, existing is roughly 50 to 70 feet of roadway. We're talking about getting down to roughly 40. Uh, we will lose some parking spots um, as a result of gaining all of this sort of ecological and pedestrian and cyclist benefit. Um, Sidewalks will maintain a consistent and generous width rather than going from very skinny to very wide. It'll be sort of a, a much more continuous um, uh, stretch. Um, and we'll have a lot more space for stormwater treatment, green space, uh, and space for arts and, and um, gathering, which again is a really big priority from the public point of view. Next. Um, we understand parking is going to be a concern for businesses for lots of folks. Uh, we do have, uh, again, another kind of toolkit of ways we think we can sort of alleviate those concerns um, from leveraging technology, parking management apps, um, variable and peak hour pricing, um, the real-time feedback on parking locations, creating incentives, building out better infrastructure um, in terms of where bike parking happens, in terms of transit accommodations, wayfinding. Um, and then vary parking restrictions along the length of the street um, to reflect land use, seasonal demand, um, and think about flex spaces. And so with that, I will hand it over to Steve Woods, who's gonna talk about uh, two sort of conceptual ways of treating what, what is essentially kind of a, a similar cross-section in each. Thanks, yeah. Uh, hi, good evening, my name is Steve Woods with HC Landscape and Planning. Uh, and talking about the two options, we have two different approaches, um, as says, says mentioned, um, that uh, look to approach the site in two ways. So these two uh, sort of simple graphs, graphics or diagrams you see are uh, sort of 
basic representations of looking at the aerial we looked at before, Main Street below. So if you can imagine um, looking down on the plan um, and uh, how those areas are broken up by block. Um, for the Archville Gateways, uh, approach one, um, it's looking to uh, take the plan and um, make really clean gateway sections and, and um, really clean uh, interactions and, and uh, opportunities at each of the intersections. The Lake City Mountain option uh, begins to break it up into different zones that reflect the qualities of Burlington. So starting with the first one, uh, we looked to create a, a dignified and continuous streetscape for all six blocks with infamous emphasis on placemaking and focus at the crossroads and the gateways. So we have these large bubbles that are representing each of the intersections and a larger one at the center space. Um, the plan, uh, as it were, begins to reflect this in a very clean and um, symmetrical manner. You have a consistent street line of trees that reads down the roadway um, going from east to west, from Union all the way down to Battery Street, um, culminating um, at sort of the heart, as it were, of Main Street between Church Street and St. Paul. Um, in this block, we would look to use a, um, a, a shared roadway or, or a curbless roadway in this, in this, in this condition um, where there might be more flexibility of movement um, between the pedestrian realm uh, adjacent businesses, which are rich and um, uh, bountiful in this area, and obviously uh, City Hall Park with this new renovation and activation. Um, the lower images begin to show some blow ups in these areas or enlargements within each of these zones are corresponding with the blue circles above, um, starting at Union Street um, down to the middle section between, um, uh, sorry, centering on Church Street and then uh, also holding down towards battery. In the plan, you can begin to see the uh, differentiation between the roadway, um, parking where that exists, um, opportunities for turn lanes um, going onto different streets, a bicycle, bicycle track or bicycle um, means of movement that's indicated in green. And in this option, it's shown as a clear and consistent line. Um, at the intersections, at the corners, we have opportunities for clear uh, pedestrian crossings, much closer and shorter crossings given the reduced roadway width. Um, we also have opportunities for expanded green. In most of these cases, we might see stormwater being handled within these areas at these intersections. Um, taking a little different look at it, looking at it in cross section, um, starting down um, between Champlain and Battery, we have a cross section that is shown here that begins to express how uh, pedestrian movement is occurring at the edges of the space, which is shown in orange, um, a tree buffer zone between that and the main cycle movement area, um, parking and a um, sort of uh, furnishing zone, as we call it. This is where you might find your typical street signs and roadway lighting, um, clear movement of vehicles, um, um, both uh, transit and uh, single rider vehicles. Uh, there was some notion or, or uh, uh, a moment where we were talking about flex spaces. Um, in certain areas, there may be opportunities uh, to use some parking space for expanded um, cafe seating or dining. We see this a lot. We've seen this happen a lot over the past few years where outdoor dining has become um, uh, much more needed for space and, and um, health reasons. We see this as being opportunities for seasonal use and expanded use in certain areas, select areas. Um, then the and then the uh, cross section begins to run back towards the opposite side. Again, with cycle track on both sides, both uphill and downhill, um, green barrier or green buffer zone, and then the um, walking and pedestrian zone. In some areas, you see a little red cross hatch. This again is just expressing the encumbrances we might have given grade change. We all know the uh, really uh, dramatic slope we have going from east to west, uh, a lot of those encumbrances are associated with uh, allowing for uh, accessibility to adjacent businesses uh, or uh, frontages along the street. Another cross-section, uh, this one's a, a potential typical cross-section right in the center of Church Street. An opportunity, uh, as I mentioned before, for a curbless uh, section here, similar to what's happening along Church Street. Um, celebrating the, uh, multiple uses of people within different spaces, um, sort of seeding the, the space to the pedestrian when appropriate. 
opportunities for art happening at the ground plane and possibly above the ground, above the ground plane. Um, also forgot to notice and mention that you'll see these little bubbles pop up where there's um, uh, blue notes. These are taken from the community outreach and different surveys and groups that we, we spoke to and heard from um, and some of the comments that they made during, during those meetings. Uh, more signage to know where parking is. Um, even having the signage uh, speak to uh, good places for drop-offs and sidewalks and activity. <clears throat> In the third cross-section, this is closer up toward Union. Um, again, looking at the bubbles, um, obviously the public wants to see more shade trees, um, street trees, and to, to offer shade. Um, branding that speaks to placemaking and um, and different strategies for speaking to Burlington specifically on along Main Street. Um, one of the, the challenges along this stretch, you'll notice to the right-hand side is a, a very large and deep running encumbrances. Um, in this case, in retaining parking, um, that uphill bike lane becomes a shared path um, to maintain the ability to have the gesture of green space, bike and pedestrian movement and parking with all, all within that lessened um, cross section. So, as as was mentioned before, we're looking to be uh, um, nimble in making sure all of these different activities are being captured within the multiple different cross sections. Art used as a gateway element is a very strong strategy within this uh, option. Um, so, looking at the intersections as key moments or key opportunities to express art. Um, potentially being able to use cool sculptures and interactive and inviting opportunities of art for kids. It's one of the things we heard from the youth focus groups. Uh, being able to make sure that the art is um, representative of all the different groups and communities that are here um, to translate the signage and art into uh, the primary spoken languages of, of all the people that are there. The, the holder culture and the green space as it's expressed within this option begins to continue along this uh, clean and crisp and ordered system of planting where available. Um, nice even rows of, of shade trees that repeat, being able to uh, pop the corners and intersections, you will, if you will, with uh, color and possibly different heights of trees and textures of trees at those intersections as well as being able to have the center um, pick up on that color a bit more between Church Street and St. Paul. Stormwater and its, um, and its management is also being considered along Main Street. In this case, we're looking to use um, very clean and uh, ordered systems of capturing stormwater. Um, we're best available along the street. We're in communications with all different um, groups within the city, understanding the challenges in uh, using stormwater um, management in these steep slopes. We wanna make sure that they're located and being handled appropriately and, uh, and to avoid scarring and misuse um, um, in these sloped conditions along the street. And then a final blow up of this Artful Gateways ones begins to take a closer look at the streetscape and, and start, start to identify specific zones that are present in both options. Um, we have the adjacency to business spill out space, which is basically the front zones that happen along buildings. Um, some opportunities uh, to expand that where possible or to have that even extend into uh, special, special amenity zones, which are shown in yellow or even furnishing zones, which are shown in the darker pink. Um, in most cases, those furnishing zones um, will be the space where we would uh, land street trees uh, in large planting pockets with available soil, um, potential use of uh, uh, structural soil or, or cellular um, systems beneath grade to make sure that trees are growing in appropriate soil capacity zones. Um, when those areas aren't using, being used for green space, that's where you would find seating pockets. And in this option, they'd be more uh, in a kind of clean, manicured and normal rhythmic uh, location along the streets. Uh, the last portion is this light, light pink, which is shown uh, weaving in and extending out into parking spaces. Um, opportunities to convert these spaces into special event or seasonal spill out spaces is, 
uh, is what where these are being shown. Um, again, uh, locating these opportunities where best suited uh, adjacent to businesses or adjacent to community areas, um, such as a park. The second design option, um, the Lake City Mountain looks to uh, break down the street into three distinct zones. Um, and having these zones be uh, expressive of the landscape character, both in planting and in materiality of, of the sort of three main zones um, moving downhill from Burling, um, moving downhill towards the lake. So we have the mountain, which is located at the eastern end of the site, city located in the center and lake as you move down towards the western end. The same plan view uh, begins to show how this plan um, expresses itself in a large grand scale. Um, uh, as you zoom in, you begin to see opportunities for the bike lane to make more of a meandering movement in certain areas where possible, um, creating larger planted pockets um, um, and offering more of a varied planted um, aspect as you move down the street. Um, Again, looking at the, uh, the portion up next to Union, we see that we have a bike lane that's weaving in and out, providing these larger planted pockets. Same thing as you move towards Church Street and towards those intersections. Um, the same gesture would be expressed in a more clean and accessible portion of the streetscape between Church Street and St. Paul, where we have, um, again, a curbless street section with accessible pedestrian movement across um, towards City Hall Park and then back towards the Flint and other businesses to the south. And the meandering begins to pick up a bit more as you get down towards the western end after Champlain Street. The cross sections are, are pretty similar. Um, we're still containing the same types of activities in both opportunities, um, even with these minor movements of the, the streetscape occurring and the, and, the, and the bike lanes occurring. Um, still opportunities for rain gardens to occur, many opportunities for sitting um, and hanging out along the street where we're available. Um, in this option, we use art and signage, as, as you will see later, to focus on the uh, multicultural, multilingual um, <coughs> opportunities that are available within the city. Um, again, street signage and lighting and wayfinding will be used to help identify where parking is occurring, both on street and in adjacent areas off, off of Main Street. And as you move towards the east, we can see how those planted pockets offer um, possibly a different type of experience for the bicycle rider, um, where they're moving and weaving between planted areas that are buffering them both from um, pedestrian traffic and also from parking and vehicular movement. Um, we still have on the south side of the street in this option, um, the uh, combination of bike and pedestrian movement in the uphill movement um, uh, due to encumbrances that are adjacent to this area. Again, uh, back with the art, um, it's uh, less of a application of art in the expression of gateway, but more of an application of a network of art being weaving through and um, um, sprinkling throughout the whole strength, the length of the roadway. Um, opportunities that have this art really speak to um, the co-creation of it, um, both with uh, community members, as well as professional artists. Um, installations could be temporary, um, uh, where they would um, appear and, and reappear in different areas along the street. Um, interactive work that give people and kids an opportunity to play and have a voice. As I mentioned before, the overall concept of planting is one that's a little bit more organic and begins to draw off the type of natural and native species that may occur in different areas um, of the biomes of the area of, of, of Burlington. Um, and speaking to the sort of natural systems of the mountain, more orderly systems of the city, and back to some more natural systems along the way. Stormwater and the management of water is still occurring within this design, um, but again, looking to see if there might be more of a uh, 
uh, naturalistic or place appropriate expression of water and how it's captured and converted and moved throughout the systems. Um, native wetlands and uh, more natural, naturalistic systems happening to the east, the opportunity for more structured or channelized um, systems that are happening within the center portion, city portion of the streetscape, and then back to a naturalized and uh, gathered or, or um, um, uh, baffled system happening more towards the west. And then finally, looking at the different types of zones and how they're treated, you can see that all the different um, uh, types of zones are still represented, um, but the actual length and location and form of the zones begin to shift a little bit due to the movement and change of the bike path. Um, so you might have opportunities for longer, more contiguous um, uh, furnishing zones or larger opportunities for special mini zones at the corners. Um, um, that coupled with uh, the access and movement from adjacent businesses to um, spill out spaces begin to make a really rich and um, unique um, streetscape. So once again, uh, two options that we're working with, very similar, they all sort of need to function, they all need to be safe, they all need to uh, work well, but we like to try to find opportunities to differentiate the spaces a bit, either through landscape, through materiality, through form, um, through um, engagement and access by the people who are using those spaces. So I think I'll hand it over back to Evan to talk about the next steps. Okay, thanks, Steve. So as I mentioned earlier, we are developing concepts now and trying to get through the development of the concepts. Um, we have a neighborhood meeting Thursday night, so that's coming right up this week, and we're meeting with the uh, DPW Commission tomorrow night. So we're getting the word out on the concepts, making this presentation, uh, and then, as I mentioned before also, we are hoping to get city council approval in May. Um, we're gonna be following up uh, after the engagement with city council and doing additional listening sessions uh, for anyone who wants to participate in the project. Uh, and the development of the concepts will continue through most of the summer. Um, if uh, anyone wants to be, uh, engage in the project before the 14th of May, uh, you can visit greatstreetsbtv.com and there's an online survey uh, to give uh, your opinions about things. Um, and, or you can always email Olivia Doris uh, at the city there. Um, so the plan then going forward will be to uh, get really so solid concepts together uh, by the end of the summer and then proceed on to the preliminary plans, which should wind down in early 2023, and then final plans in uh, the large part of 2023, and bids for construction should be in late 2023, and then on to construction. So that's the plan moving forward. Um, a lot of outreach in between now and then, uh, including this meeting. And with that, that's all we had for a formal presentation. So we would open it up at this point to any discussion or questions you folks would have. Yeah, I would uh, just like to mention, um, since this is the only two meeting between now and it's actually the council meeting on the 23rd, that we're going to look for an action where you plan to bring the presentation on the 9th um, and also encourage public if they want to provide feedback other than at the New York meeting to come to the council meeting. Um, and then subsequently are also visiting the DPW Commission to hopefully gain their support, uh, Transition Marketplace Commission and the Parks Commission as they all have regulatory roles in what we are proposing for the concept. Um, so we'll do that throughout May. So we are seeking hopefully your support to bring this concept presentation uh, forward to the council so that the council will ultimately at the end of May be able to provide direction to the city team this project moving forward. We also have um, Martin here from our water resources group. It's not highlighted. Um, you know, we talked a lot about the free service stuff, but if you guys do have questions about the underground utility work that's happening with this project, um, it's also here. Great. Great. 
Great, thank you so much. Was there a chat that came out that had come in at some point, Maddie? Uh, it was just Marcy saying thank you. Oh, okay. All right, great. Great, thank you so much. Very exciting stuff, very interesting stuff. Um, counselors, questions, comments? Um, did this presentation get made to the NPAs or was there a previous one? There was a different version of the presentation that happened throughout the months of February and first half of March, where really we were introducing, re reintroducing the idea of Great Streets, kind of some of its milestone goals, but really trying to take in organic feedback about um, what the community is looking for now, what their concerns are, what their aspirations are. The streets. So this concept here really developed on top of the base plan for the previous effort to, to hopefully update it to where we are today. So tonight's the first. Right. Yeah. I, I, I sort of yeah. I, I wanted to, to nail that down because my thinking, and again I keep adding things for y'all to do, uh, is you know that this would also then go to the um, the NPAs and be made available through the front porch forums. I think it is really, really important in all of these big projects that people see that the input that they have made has been listened to, has been considered, has been incorporated, or can ask questions about where it hasn't been. So that it is not a dog and pony show, but it is a real iterative process to get to a place that the community wants. So uh, I, I'm hoping that within the concept of your timing for coming back to the city council, that all that stuff can be done. Front porch forum sent out so that there's more solicitation. If the uh, May 14th is a deadline, we've got a few you know, weeks or a couple of weeks so that people can do the survey through the link. MPAs are gonna be happening in the middle of that month. Uh, you know, and it might be more difficult, but maybe there can be something that would um, integrate that. And I, and this is a citywide thing, so it's appropriate that uh, y'all are um, are working citywide. These people in Mark's area care as much about all of this, voted on it just as much as you know the people in our wards, which are like these are our wards, right? So. So the plan was not to go back to every NPA before we hit the city council in May. We've been um, kind of collecting people along the way. We've distributed to everybody who's participated in any of our structured meetings, um, email invitations for Thursday night, um, as well as indication that the survey is there. We've collected um, throughout our focus groups, uh, just a really large distribution list. We've already sent out notifications on front porch forum of the upcoming meeting. We've placed yard signs, and we will continue that kind of outreach effort. You know, we've hopefully collected the people who want to actively engage us so that they are informed of our, our next steps. The NPAs, I will admit, was probably one of the most challenging engagements that we did. Um, the, the, the time that NPAs have to be able to hear all of the city issues is really challenging. So you don't get significant engagement while well, you can push information out it's not more major because we're not able to hear the feedback um, whereas our meeting that we're planning on thursday we're breaking out into small focus groups so that um, our, our design team is going to be able to hopefully hear in smaller groups feedback from the community as they're able to really provide quality engagement back uh, we saw that in our small focus groups it was they're some of the most impressive engagement that I've done in my time at the city it was these small focus groups that we met with our youth with our BIPOC with our mobility challenged um, just the the ideas that we were able to hear because we were able to give people time in small groups. The NPAs haven't provided that to date. I've been to basically every NPA since January on this project. Um, we're certainly happy to go and give presentations. I don't think, and as Evan indicated, you know, the vote from the city council in May is, is really to help provide positive direction, but 
you are responsible for eroding in the line, of the, the changes of the line and the grade of the road. So changing our curb line from 50 to 70 feet down to 40 feet is, is the monumental step that we're looking for in May. Um, as it relates to the rest of the community of foot, we still have that time and we still want that time. There's a lot more specific questions that we're going to need to answer as it relates to different user groups of Main Street and also people who do live, do live in the adjacent to or operate a business in the adjacent. So that's my take on it. Also, just add that at sorry at the NPAs, we were very clear about what those next engagement opportunities were and how people could stay involved through the concept design process. We were very clear about that we'd be coming back with another neighborhood meeting, that we could be going back to the city council, um, that we'd be coming to all the commissions and the two, and that that process would continue. So we never indicated that we'd be back to NPAs, but we are very clear about how people could stay involved, stay engaged with the, uh, with the project. And that seemed to work um, very, very well for us. So I, 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 I'm not entirely sold on that. Um, I think that maybe a, a more focused conversation there, maybe even around the, just the, the question that's going to be placed to the city council might be appropriate instead of so much information just to get people so that we can get that feedback because it will spark some people to, to reach out. Or, I wonder if we could do that as part of DPW's construction season overview and have that as a key element of the, our rounds that we do in May around construction. I, just something, I, I mean, I, I think that public engagement is tricky and it's essential. <laughs> um, and I, I don't think that we've done as great a job. I, I have sat on your side of the table, as you know, and so I. I take full responsibility for being part of that problem. Um, so I, 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 so yeah, anything that you know, as as Jake is saying, anything that we can we can sort of reach out to these places um, would be very, very. Okay. okay, we'll try. I'm just hearing from Rob that uh, there may not be space on the agendas for May at this point. But I mean, if they if they decide that they don't have time for you, yeah. then they decide that. I mean, yeah. like you yeah. can take that horse to water, but yeah. right. Um, the other avenue that we have is that, you know, these these MPAs do have their own distribution lists. And so we can push them out to their steering committees so that they can at least provide their information out um, to, to let people know that this engagement time period is happening. That would be that would be yeah. great. And again, if there's a there's a focus on what the city council would be asked to do, that might be really helpful. Yeah, we can structure our outreach yeah. um, around that. Yeah, but that sounds better. Thank you. Anything else? So, um, this is really exciting. Um, but I, I'm wondering about what you'll be asking the city council. Will you be asking them to choose between these two concepts? Or are you asking us uh, strictly to just provide you the um, the, the narrowing of the roadway so that you can implement one of these eventually? Or, and are there other concepts that might evolve? Or is, are these the two that have been sort of narrowed down? Um, a little bit of both. Um, obviously, we are looking for the support uh, to change the, the curb line of the road to allow for either of these two options. But we are looking for your comments um, and or direction. I don't know that there's really been a significant uh, other alternative on concepts. Maybe um, Steve, you still here, of course, Susan. <laughs> um, you can yeah. speak to the second half of Councillor Barlow's question. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think that the intent moving forward is to take these two options, which are um, actually sort of summaries of multiple options that we've been developing and getting feedback from, from all the different engagement um, groups and internal groups and technical reviews um, 
and we're in this next uh, neighborhood meeting that we're having later this later this week um, is to really dive down and let people re begin to respond to the different aspects of these of these areas. Um, there's we've always thought about it as being there's some fixed items um, that are sort of incumbent on uh, travel ways and movement. There's a lot of the uh, the kind of not really intangibles, but the things that really make spaces special to the people who are going to be using them. Um, we really that's, and that's what we're kind of trying to glean from. We're trying to hear back from the community to say, what's what is a successful um, open space along the street for you? Hey, businesses, what's what's the engagement between um, uh, proximity of your space to a bike path mean to you? What is how much shade is too much shade? How much seating is more, not enough seating? All these different aspects that begin to really form the design. Um, after we get that information, I think the intent or the hope is to have what may end up being some sort of a hybrid um, quality plan concept that's then presented um, for acceptance and um, as we move forward. Um, and as Laura said, um, there's still much more um, development within schematic design and uh, continuing design that happens after that approval um, that uh, will happen in these listening sessions. Um, so I, I think it's not necessarily choose option A or choose option B. Uh, it's going to be something that's going to be more of a hybrid that's um, re more reflective of the community feedback that we're, we're going to get this week um, and moving forward. Great. I, I, I like both of the concepts. I mean, just we're presenting the airport gateways. So I really like that. And then I liked uh, the Lake City Mountains really well. And I can see everybody so sort of struggling with that. So I'm glad that we may not be asked to choose option A or option B. I think it could be as dicey as some of the redistricting conversations. Yeah, I've been right there. <laughs> we did, I did see Rob's hands this afternoon, I think in response to your question okay. too. Okay. So before you keep going. Yeah. Rob, were you looking to answer Councilor Garlow's question? Sorry, uh, Chair Hanson, I was more intending to speak to the NPA question, if that's relevant now or later on in the meeting. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, yeah, go, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say to speak to, um, I think, what we heard from Laura about the way the outreach has been laid out and certainly from Councillor Bergman's uh, interest in the NPA. I, I don't think that there is time generally at this point to get on this current month's, meaning May's NPA sessions, but um, what we have done in the past is go to the public forums to at least share information in that two minute slot at the beginning. And uh, that maybe is a compromise. It's a tight compromise, given that it's only two minutes and not a 20 minute presentation, but that would be a way I think we could share information in those forums, at least how people can watch the videos of the meetings that have happened, learn more, and then certainly get the contact information for the project team, should they want to follow up directly. And that would give us probably the ability to get to half of the NPAs by the middle of May, uh, if we were to do that. Got it. Thanks, Rob. Uh, I'm so far, I uh, sure. I was going to say, with regards to the NPAs, you're in. We're in luck because Word Four Seven is tomorrow night, so I can at least um, make an effort at um, getting the word out on this. And I would even be willing to give a, my my update time to DBW. You wanted it. Because I'm sure that I'll have like five minutes or something. But I'm also Great. willing to share what we um, what you communicated tonight. Yeah. Um, and I could link people to the presentation if that's appropriate. Um, yeah. yeah, in some fashion, we'd love to be represented at his DPW commission night. It's a week from oh, right. now. Right. So we'll have to talk through that. Okay. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll find someone. Let me know and you can yeah. ask me tomorrow. Yeah. Um, the other thing I was wondering about with regard to the survey, I went to the survey. Are you going to like poll people on these concepts maybe, or is there any intent about getting feedback? On, the on way that? that we were hoping to run the meeting um, was to not use polls. Okay. Uh, we're also going to run it as a Zoom meeting so that it can be a little bit more personal, kind of like the setup and um, so that people can feel like they're here in the meeting, they can see who else is in the meeting with them, and that we're really going to rely on the breakout rooms to allow people to vocalize what they're interested in. There, um, there is the separate survey so that um, we can take in feedback on these concepts, but it's not really an idea to, to, to vote on one or the other. I think, as you heard from Steve today, um, and as you feel, I also feel that there's elements of each that I think will make a great Main Street. 
Um, but there's also some of those people like me who see the um, the artful gateway and go, that is so clean and amazing. And, and my engineering brain who loves squares goes, this feels great, but then I get inspired by the Lake City Mountain and just go, you know, that feels like home. So I, I do hope that we come to a, a compromise, <laughs> but uh, that's for the public to help with this. Thanks. It's only okay. But to be clear, the council is not going to be asked to choose between the two. No, but we, we know that you represent your constituents. We want to hear your influence and, you know, hopefully coming out of the May 9th meeting, uh, hearing, hearing from all of you in, in the public then, and then at the 23rd, you know, giving suggestive direction. Uh, okay. That's the, the preference to see the, the council. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I love, I love them both. I really do. This is so exciting. Um, I think maybe what would be helpful if, if you are looking for feedback from us between these two designs is maybe like a grid that shows the differences, you know, just showing like bikeability, walkability, run to storm water. Like if there was a way to kind of say like which one was better on different criteria, um, I don't know if that's applicable in this scenario, but <laughs> that's exactly me, that sorry. Uh, sorry to interrupt. That's exactly our plan for the breakout rooms on Thursday okay. night is to actually have folks in smaller chunks of you know 10 to 15, whatever people um kind of evaluate each scheme on those like comfort and safety and um you know ecology and things like that. Um oh, and yeah. so we hope to have a lot of qualitative as opposed to quant you know it isn't so much like tallying up votes as it is like you know a series of comments and questions that we're literally like writing down and putting on sort of virtual sticky notes um to share with everyone what everyone else is saying and really you know land at what will end up probably being some sort of um hybrid of the two okay okay yeah that makes sense i mean i i don't know who all is going to be participating but for like for me, I would have no idea which one would be better for stormwater or it was a little unclear for me to tell which one had more like continuity for the bike lanes, just stuff like that. Um, so it might if there's anything you all can right tell folks when you're asking for input about okay, this one has more continuous bike infrastructure or this one is gonna deal better with stormwater, like just anything to tell us about some of the quantitative differences between the plans. I don't, maybe that's not possible though. And along that, those lines, it would also be useful to know, like they look great and they look in those summertime photos, but are there differences in sort of wintertime uh, maintenance it's, yeah. or um, is one more, you know, or uh, do we lose more parking with one or another? I know that they, we do um, not. We, uh, we, we've settled on retaining 90 spaces of the, um, it's actually 157 out there currently, but our math, when we do the, the numbers say that there should have been able to be 160 out there. Um, but in the in the concept plan that's being shown, there's, there's 90 routine. Um, parking on every, every face of every block in some fashion. Um, as it relates to the, the idea of some of the trade-offs or, or the pros and cons of the two options, I think that the bike facility one is one that we could highlight a little bit stronger. Um, it's not mentioned here, but it was mentioned in our original neighborhood presentation. The hills that come in and out of you know this core area are fairly steep, um, and they certainly have uh, our design team thinking about ways that we can continue to encourage safe speeds for both vehicles and bicycles going through these areas. Um, and so the Mountain City Lake creating the meanderingness of the bike facility could create, you know provide a natural traffic bombing. Um, whereas, you know, the other one, it's, it's really going to have to be done in a, a different fashion. So there are a few of those types of qualitative, you know, pros and cons of a natural design achieving the goal that I think both of them have. Okay. Yeah, I think it, it yep. seems like you're trying to get away from this maybe, so I feel kind of bad recommending it, but just any like side-by-side -side comparisons, you know. Mm -hmm. And it seems like you're trying to do it more holistically, which is great. Um, but if there are any of those, I think, uh, were you going to say something, Steve? No, yeah, it's, it, it's a really good point. The, the, the ability to kind of 
clearly rank and score <laughs> between the options can often help in decision making. It's it's tricky because um, we want both of them to be winners. <laughs> we want both of them to success to be successful in all aspects. Um, not that they both can be, but I think we're at a point in the design early enough that we're not letting that be a limiting factor in selecting any of the options that are happening here. We really want to be able to make sure that we're responding to the feedback we hear from people about the quality of the spaces they want to have and, the, and, and how that's included, knowing that we'll need to solve for those options of appropriate safety, appropriate uh, uh, containment and use of stormwater in any option that we come out with. So um, I don't think we've gotten to a point where we've uh, designed ourselves into a position that one is offering a better option than the other in those aspects. Steve, just to put a fine point on it, because I think what Jack's getting to, we could get to pretty quickly, which is both of them have continuous bike facilities, except for where it gets pinched up on the top block of between Winooski and Union, where going eastbound, the bike and pedestrian facility has emerged. Other than that, both have the same continuous facilities. Both have generally the same abilities for stormwater. The cross section is generally the same. It's really the flavor of the street uh, and the kind of aesthetic that is different. So um, you were not going to get like this one has bike facility, this one has wide, wider sidewalks. It's more organic versus a more linear kind of design from what I've taken in. Would that be fair, Steve? Yes, that, that is fair. I think um, there are nuanced conditions in different areas, which I think are really special and interesting. Um, I, the thing that we don't know, and the thing that we're looking to glean out of, of all these engagements and especially this community meeting is to learn from people who live and work and play and stay in these spaces, where those where those hidden gems may be that we really need to to let sing more to really make the streetscape as a whole space uh, be of of the of the place. So I, I just I think that we have a really excellent team, very very um, talented group of engineers and designers and and thinkers that can solve those problems that you mentioned before. We just want to make sure we're not missing um, and skipping over what the people really need to have the uh, businesses and the place uh, be rich and, and giving back to the community. That's great. Yeah, that all makes sense. Yeah, maybe it's just showing people, okay, here's what each one has that the other doesn't and people can say, and maybe people will say, I want all of those things that we, like you said, we just merge them into one that has everything. Or maybe there's a few that people don't seem to care about and we drop those or whatever, but. Um, yeah. And if if I'm able to if we're able to achieve that project that gives everything everybody wants, then I'll just quit. So <laughs> retire, not quit, right? Retire. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Great. Um, so before we contemplate any action, is there anything else from counselors or the team? Okay. So what uh, what do you uh, what are you all seeking from us at this point? Um, we are seeking your support uh, to bring the concepts for Main Street forward to the city council. Okay. That you feel like we've done enough diligence, that we've collected enough information, um, and that we have ourselves put together enough to, to bring this to the council. Okay. I don't feel like you need our permission for that, but we do need sponsorship. Think? It's it's a funny thing. Yeah. Does that? Well, yeah, that's true to bring a resolution. So does anyone? So I would move that? that, assuming that you were going to take those extra efforts, um, including so, you know public forum type stuff. You know, mm -hmm. Mark up on this offer tomorrow. Yep. So I'd, I'd make that motion. Yeah. And I'll second that. Um. Yeah, I, I think I think that makes sense for MPA. It's just quick pitch at public forum and probably a lot less of a burden on you all because you know it'll be right up front at the beginning of the meetings. Um, but yeah, I, I think even if there was time, like for, for our MPA, if they were to have 20 minutes of DPW, I know they would want it to be on sidewalks or something. I don't think they would want it. 
the interest in our NPA of DPW staff, there's a lot, and this isn't at the top of the list. So I it's the opportunity for people to say, I don't care, go do what you want, and then you go, thank you very much. Yeah, so so, so I don't I don't I don't think at this stage in the process, I don't feel like staff should or needs to give presentations at NPAs right now, but I, obviously I don't see any issue with giving a plug at for the forum and allowing people to access this information that want to see it and that want that presentation they can watch it you know on their own time. So any other discussion? I just had a question about the the, the meeting on uh, Thursday night. It's not on the city calendar. Is it published somewhere? So the challenge with the city calendar is that that's for warrant meetings. Okay. Um, yeah. Main Street doesn't meet that criteria to go on the main city calendar. It is on DPW's so calendar. DPW. We are going to republish it on all of our social media um, so that it can be as yeah. visible as possible. But uh, it's a fortunate quirk. Okay. So it's on DPW's calendar. I just need to know that if I end up telling yeah. folks tomorrow. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And if you just Google the Main Street, Great Streets, it, yep. we have a special website with all the yep. engagement opportunities. Great. Yep. Um, it is a hybrid meeting, so if you want to attend in person, um, we're actually in the Fisher Conference room. I think it'll still work better, though, if, uh, if we can encourage people to do it remotely. Great. Ready to vote. Let's go. Ready to vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 That passes unanimously. Thank you all so much. Um, yeah, thank you, Laura. So take care, okay, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for your support. Okay, thank you. Um, great. So now we go to the director's report. Given the hour, I'm happy to uh, defer if, uh, unless there's any questions on the council updates. All right, counselors, anything? Questions for, for Chief? Yes, uh, this is counselor's update. Counselor update, oh. yeah, yeah. slash questions. I, I would just like to say that since the sidewalk presentation last night, I was out walking my dog tonight and I found myself evaluating all the sidewalks. <laughs> out, so thank you for putting that in my head. <laughs> Yeah, same here. Where I was walking home after council with Zariah, we reached this stretch on Willard, and we're like, "This sidewalk's amazing." It was like brand; it seemed brand new on North Willard. It was even rain stretch. Yeah, serious poor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're gonna hire you all as our inspectors. Yeah, you can yeah. rate the sidewalks. Well, there, our first sidewalk inspection citywide was a. Uh, observatory inspection. It was a subjective inspection. Wow. We now move to um, so object. I'm allowed to respond because yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, uh, Councilor Bergman brought up a great point. You know, between now and the next tooth meeting, um, you know, any engagement or questions that you guys have from us to be able to help us with what we're going to provide you um, at the next meeting would be would be great. One of the things I forgot to mention last night with our new inventory is that every section that was measured has a photo with it. And we do have um, a public facing tool that we didn't have the last time that we're working on being able to be ready when we roll this out um, after this Q and QC processing. So if you guys do get questions from people saying, you know, this is the worst sidewalk that I've ever seen in the city, you know, we can look at this tool and be able to be like, is it? It doesn't compare to these other examples um, that the ranking system has as kind of our sidewalks. So that's also as part of what we see behind the scenes that I forgot to mention yesterday. Which we were doing before, but it just required me going there in person. Yes. So it has made it, it streamlined the process. Great. So it would be very helpful to have a to have every street and sidewalk on a list that's that with its ranking. I mean, at the end of the day, that's what people need to, to know. They need to know that this particular street that they care about, where is it, where is it ranked? And, and then we get to, you know, understanding how it is and it's ranked. Um, that would be an incredibly valuable piece of information for people to be able to access. 
because at the, I think at the end of the day, what you're looking at is, you know, you're, you're ranking them and going, this is higher than, than that. And if things, if there's a tie, yeah. you know, or there, there, there's, even if there's a bucket that says all these are in this particular category and we look at them sort of e you know, like equally, that's, it, it really is just, that's really important information for people to know. I can get on board with the bucket concept. Um, the individual specific ranking becomes really challenging um, because you are assigning a number to something that is, it is still somewhat subjective categories and they change over time. So the inspection period is five to eight years and a tree would be in the sidewalk now substantially at that time, depending on the tree. Sure. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, easily, and we've had and I talked about it yesterday or today even, you know, Let's put out that category of you know what is our serious sidewalks, but not say you know this one's serious because it's an 87, and this one's serious because it's an 86, and you know that's not how we're going to end up ultimately programming the final work plan. So I think that that second step about the programming of the final work plan, that, you know, most people that's what they really care about. Mm -hmm. You know, where does this and so uh, you know you, you doing what you have now, but then having something, if it's down the line, that's okay. But that allows people to say, okay, if you're making a decision as to which individual street or sidewalk is getting done and which is not. So you are ranking them. Maybe you are saying this is elevated and the rest of you are staying in the bucket. So the, you know, uh, there, there's, that's really what, what people are yeah. going to look at. I think, yes, I forwarded your email to the team. We're talking about it. I think the, the key here is, James, we got to balance transparency, which I think we all agree is important, with putting out data that is going to shift and change, and, and people are going to feel upset and want to know information. And just the level of minutia, if it's not valuable and things are fluid, for example, a tree root heaving, creating a situation that's different than the number. We've had paving projects like on Ferguson that have been on the paving list for four years. It's going to happen next year. It's going to happen next year. There's all sorts of things we can talk about why that shifted. But how much time, this crew is only five people big. If we spend all our time answering why Ferguson is this, that, and the 37 and 52, we're not going to get anything done. So it's a balance. I, 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 I accept that. Yeah. That balance and so I'm I'm pushing for yeah. a little you know a few yeah. more pennies on that you know uh, on the scale on this side to, to bring that and yeah. I spent time with Cindy Cook this weekend because I've heard concerns from her and others about how things are getting prioritized. I want to try to be an answering question and I want to respect staff's ability to focus. Yeah, yeah, I, I yeah, I think we'll, we'll we'll work together. I'm sure yeah. we'll we're gonna be talking about this. Um in between and also at the next meeting as a focus. Yes. Um, yeah. Because I'm hearing it a lot too from constituents. So. Yeah. So I'm also sidewalks. That's right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 So really great. appreciate it. And I just this team managing great streets at the same time, managing sidewalks at the same time, managing Amtrak or Burlington and Parkway. I mean, I gotta keep this team. <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, they're amazingly talented and hard work. How many evening meetings are they working this week? So um, we'll work together to find a way. And I, I want to help you succeed. And I know you want to help us succeed. So we'll figure it out. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. All right. Speaking of the future, I would like us to, in the, in the next meeting to put the, north, the, put the, the progress is on North Quincy Avenue for, you know, mm -hmm. TDM stuff that shared you know the alternative part. So okay. I just can, email, yeah, yeah. Email I just wanted to the four of us. Yes. Okay, Jane. And just tell us to add it. I'm gonna add put it on for so you to join the items right now. Yep. I have it in the So he does, does, does he do you want the email or no? You don't need it. No, I have it in the minutes, and if you're adding it to the yeah, agenda, we have a coordination document of everything that's coming in different meetings, so it all those our minds. All right, great. All right, motion to adjourn. Well, I agree with that. So, all those in favor?